So this is the um, microphone that I'll use and move this over a little like this. Yeah, so this is going to give you a room. This gives you a live stream. You have to use both. Yeah, I know. Okay, so I understand that uh, we have two microphones. <laughs> okay, so we have two. All right. Okay, were well, we going to get a conch shell blast to start the proceedings? <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> maybe not. Okay, so we're going to just dump into the deep water here and get started. Um, everything seems to be running a little bit late. Okay, I'm David Solomonoff. I'm the president of the New York chapter of the Internet Society, and I welcome you to here to LibTech NYC 2004, and we're co. Uh, co uh, Co-convening, I guess you would say, with Reclaim, and uh, th much thanks to our sponsors, uh, Allied Fiber and StealthNet. Um, I'll give a quick introduction, and then we're going to jump into the deep water here. Uh, Arthur Clark said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And this is true now more than before, because information technology, specifically software, has more in common with magical invo invocation and prayer than it does with earlier mechanical technologies like steam or the internal combustion engine. So we tell machines what to do. We hope they'll do it rather than uh, instead of shoveling coal or turning the crank or opening the valve on machinery. Carl Sagan said, we've designed our civilization based on science and technology, at the same time arranged things so that almost no one understands anything at all about science and technology. So as technology becomes more deeply embedded in our lives, it becomes more and more layered and compartmentalized so that no individual knows how it all works. This makes us vulnerable to, both to accidents and to acts of malice that we can't comprehend. The question is, are we dis destined to devolve into a cargo cult or struggle against malevolent ghosts and the machines. George Orwell described the ways language could be used to control people's thoughts and hence their behavior. William Burroughs called language a virus, seeing it as external to humanity and a danger if not controlled. So the solutions to these issues and these questions of these dangers uh, both require full access to the technologies that we use and the freedom to learn how they work and modify them to suit our needs. Today's LibTech conference is about liberating technology so that it becomes human-centric and empowers rather than enslaves. This means we must fully own and control our information even when we choose to share it. The need for privacy and the benefits of open technology and open content don't conflict. They're all about the need for human beings to control the future of information for human needs, whether to protect or to share. So that's the broad overview, uh, and we're going to throw things over next to Ted. We'll talk just briefly about Reclaim. And then uh, Srihari and Hunter will talk about um, st uh, Allied Fiber and Stealth. Okay, you need to use both the. Okay. Hi, just wanted to introduce everybody um, and greet everybody to the program. Um, introducing Reclaim. Um, we're co producing this with the New York Internet Society. Reclaim is a movement that has grown out of Occupy. Um, we're a number of people who have worked together um, pre-Occupy, during Occupy. Um, during the occupation, um, people within our group um, were involved in creating the open source work group, the tech op work group, and the Occupy Earth Summit work group. And now two years later, we've, we've continued working together and have been um, trying to distill everything that we learn through Occupy and, and move the agenda forward. Um, key to that was our involvement with the United Nations Earth Summit, um, Rio Plus 20 in June of 2012. Um, we sent representatives to Rio. We were re recognized by the UN and presented um, the United Nations with a document called the Open Source Imperative. It's an outline, and, and, and we will be presenting about Reclaim later in the day, um, but it's, um, it's, it's an outline on how open source can be globally transformative, how open source adds to the commons, 
and how open source is a key tool in, um, in our ability to deal with global corporations and create a better balance. Um, so, um, so this is um, the soft launch of Reclaim. Reclaim will be formally launching this summer um, during the um, um, Honor Two Row Wampum campaign. This will be the second time Two Row happens and um, the celebration of um, the, um, the treaties that um, were crafted um, with the indigenous, uh, with the American Indians, and um, that happens um, August 1st. Um, last year, a couple of hundred people rode down the Hudson from, um, from Kingston to, um, to Wall Street, and um, there was a festival. Um, we're, we're doing it again this year, and um, we're doing it in partnership with, uh, with Two Row. So um, more about Reclaim later. And um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we have a long day ahead of us. We have lots of speakers. It's very early in the day, so I'm sure you know, people will continue drifting in during the day. Um, Robert Steele is here. Um, Robert um, is the author of um, Open Source Everything um, Manifesto and um, has um, a very deep agenda that he's been working on for the last 15, 20 years that's um, that's highly relevant to what's going on today with um, the internet, um, the FCC, um, and, um, and broader issues. So uh, let me give it back to David for... Um okay, Mr. Okay, Hari? Yeah. Okay, so um, the, the bedrock of the type of uh, open, uh, liberating technology that we're talking about uh, starts with access to infrastructure. And um, many of the telecommunication providers that we rely on for things like uh, internet service uh, have heavy restrictions on their, their use. And so today we're very fortunate to have, uh, on the other side of the, the, the equation, uh, uh, providers here that have an open uh, business model that is more appropriate uh, for what we're, we're looking for. Starting with Srihari Pandit, who has built out a uh, fiber optic network in, in New York City that uh, provides a better, uh, less expensive and more open access to internet services. Thank you so much. Okay. Right. We need to get your... Yes. Oh, okay, great. Uh, good evening. My name is Sri Hari Pandit, President and CEO of Stealth Communications. Uh, we're proud to support, you know, um, Internet Society of New York and LibTech uh, this evening. Um, Stealth is an internet service provider that was started back in 1995 by my wife and I. And um, so what I'll tell you is just a little background of the company and how we got here and kind of what we're doing now here in Manhattan. So one of the biggest challenges operating as an ISP here in the city is there's very limited choices in terms of the carriers that where we can buy dark fiber from. Um, you know, actually, in the New York City market, it was originally just a couple providers that expanded during the dot-com boom. And then obviously during the dot-com collapse, you know, a lot of consolidation has happened since. And so for our business, in order for customers to interface into our backbone, uh, we need to provision the last mile circuits, you know, from Cairo Hotels here in Manhattan to commercial buildings, you know, throughout the city. And so procuring dark fiber or lit circuits is very expensive. And dark fiber is sometimes available or it is, you know, it's available or not available based on time and day. And, uh, you know, obviously they don't want to sell that capacity to competitors like us. So the reason why dark fiber is so important for a business like us is we can run dark fiber into a commercial building and then turn up any amount of capacity we want in the building and control the capacity and economics. And so because the lack of that, um, we spent you know, the last number of years um, working on obtaining a franchise with the city of New York, basically a public right-of-way agreement. And in February 2013, um, we received that right-of-way agreement. And this actually allows us to um, you know, build our own fiber optic network. Today, uh, we started construction in June of last year, and a couple of weeks ago, we actually finished our first uh, mainline network, which runs from Columbia a circle all the way straight down to the southern tip of Manhattan. Um, the little bubble over there, that's 325 Hudson Street, a brand new carrier hotel um, that's actually operated by Hunter over here, and he'll talk more about that. So we currently have two 864s built into three, uh, 325 Hudson Street, and um, we're homing all, you know, all the commercial buildings now you know, into that carrier hotel to provide buildings either dark fiber back to the carrier hotel or providing them um, internet connectivity. So, um, yeah, just again, some pictures uh, of where the fiber runs. Um, 
Okay, so in Manhattan, the way service providers like Stealth, Verizon, and Time Warner run cables is there's a system called the Empire City Subway System. It's an entity created back in 1891, and they're the ones who are responsible for maintaining these underground ducts, and so we actually pull cables out through these white PVC ducts. Some of them are made of other materials, you know, again, it's based on um, when they were actually installed. Um, again, here's some photos of our construction crew. We actually have, as employees, our own construction crews. They actually rod, rope, and pull fiber, splice, and bring the cables into the buildings. So over here, we have a rodder, and uh, that shoots out a 2,000-foot steel rod into the duct. And, you know, we use it to clean mud if the ducts are empty, or, you know, we push it, you know, again, use a rod to pull uh, fiber um, through it. So you can see over here, they're pulling the fiber. That's our real carrier over here that holds the fiber optic cables. You know, some more pictures of them pulling cable. And here's an actual, this is how, it's pretty physical intense. So basically the guys, they have to pull cable manhole to manhole. And so just imagine how intense that is, you know, going from 60th Street all the way down to the tip of Manhattan. And so it's a pretty manual process. The systems in Manhattan are really rough. Um, again, since it's such a very old system, it's, it's um, there's a lot of blockages. So a, ru a straight run may not be possible. Sometimes we have to zigzag around. So like when we had to do the route to um, Columbus Circle, actually I'll show you over here. So yeah, if you look at this Columbus Circle route, we were supposed to go up 6th Avenue and then go west, but because we couldn't, we had to go down to 41st Street, you know, make the zigzag all the way up there, which was insane. That added over seven, 8,000 feet of extra cable. So it's uh, kind of messy over here in the city on the ground. But, um, yeah, this is 325 Hudson Street where they're doing the splicing. This is them pulling the cable into the building. <laughs> I don't know if you saw this, Hunter. <laughs> so yeah, so this is uh, yeah the, our first A6 where they got pulled in a couple of weeks ago. Oh, actually maybe two months ago. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, so once the fiber has been pulled in, we use a, a fiber optic splicing, um, yeah, a mass fusion splicer that splices all the fibers together. We use an OTDR to make sure all the fiber is clean, you know, and we have continuity through the whole path. And um, we service a wide range of customers, you know, a lot of um, large companies to, um, you know, service providers to small, mid-sized businesses here in the city. Um, so as it relates to, like, net neutrality and so forth, you know, this is a really important topic. Um, and, and f uh, so the, I guess there's two sides. On the residential side, it's really key because when you only have limited choices, one or two providers, um, Net trial is really key, is really important because um, that's the life, uh, you know, the lifeline, so to speak, to get information. Um, and, but on the other hand, uh, over-regulating it, as some people have may suggest, um, such as um, making internet access subject to Title II regulation, that hurts service providers like us because we're a small business also. But Title II means uh, there's a lot more obligations that are now imposed on us, you know, basically obligations like CLIA and so forth. I mean, we do have CLIA, compliant, uh, CLIA uh, requirements, but may not be as stringent as Title II requirements. Um, so you may have to be weighed and gathered. But the other thing I'd like to think about is, um, so let's say net, net neutrality may be hard to enforce because it's, it may not be may not be reclassifiable to Title II. Another way is governments from the city to the federal government, they can make a lot of efforts into, um, oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't realize that, sorry about that. Oh my God, this whole time. Okay, so yeah, no, what I was saying is um, another solution to uh, making internet access subject to Title II regulation is uh, cities, states, and the federal government could make more conduits available cost effectively and have them pre-installed so the service providers like us can actually install fiber you know, underground a lot more easier, just like in Manhattan. Manhattan and the Bronx actually has this Empire City subway condo system. So if they can do that on a nationwide scale and make it easy, then there could be a lot more service providers competing, you know, with these large companies. So if the larger companies uh, want to have a fast lane, a slow lane, that creates a lot more opportunities for companies like us to get into those marketplaces and provide more choice and more open access, you know, to that. But anyway, those are my, my two cents and uh, my presentation. And I think uh, Hunter is next. Oh, yes, Q&A, yes, I'll be happy to take, yes. Okay, so Empire City Subway, I hear, is good. In other words, it pays your money, and they allow you to pull the cable through whatever cross-section you pay for. You've also got a YouTube link in that. Okay, so how come that for most homes, there seem to be only a few, quote, ISPs, timeware, cable, mm -hmm. Verizon? What, I think, what are um, the blockages? Oh, yeah, I, well, well, I think there's a high cost of entry here in the New York City market. 
So uh, there's a couple parts. So for us, um, well, now it's a lot easier, but the city of New York didn't have this information franchise. It's a new type of framework on how this right of agreement, they didn't have it until most recently. So we're one of the first companies to actually. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so New York City now has this information franchise, which you know just came about last year. So we're the first franchisee in New York City to have this information franchise, which is probably internet access. And then separately, we also got a telecommunications franchise. Uh, the franchise is basically the authority to allow you to use the city public right of way to lay fiber cables below, below, you know, underground or above ground. But I thought Empire City subway simply controlled all the conflict. They do, but you can't enter the Empire City subway system or the continent system without having the franchise with the city of New York. So, to so first you have to apply to get the franchise, then you pay the city a fee, you know per year plus the per foot fees. And it was hard to get such a franchise before recently? Uh, that's, well, yes, that's because it was transitioning the franchise framework, fr the legal document. Yeah, I didn't so, know that. I, I, I had heard from people who were in the business, and I never had a discussion with them, that it was easy. You paid your money, mm -hmm. and perhaps there's some paperwork, as there is almost everything nowadays. Mm -hmm. And then the prices were reasonable, and Empire uh, Subway would not block you from Pulling the uh, fiber. Right. You're well, telling me mm -hmm. that actually my impression is wrong, that there were blockages until recently. Uh, well, I mean, they're not intentional blockages. It's just that the city needs the appropriate framework in order to give authority for someone to have the right of way um, done. But the real blockages, or the biggest problems that we face here in New York City, now that we have the franchise and we have our own employees in the trucks, uh, the real issue is there's very limited space on the ground in Manhattan. Over 70% of the ducks in Manhattan are collapsed or blocked. We, there's, like, uh, like I can tell you, we were in some sections on certain avenues and streets, we're the last cable that can fit through. And, um, you know, I've spoken to the city and I've spoken to ECS about this. And the truth of the matter is everyone's aware of the issue, uh, but there's no more physical space in the streets to put new conduits in. It's very... It's completely packed, and the ducks are so shallow now. They're like literally one foot below the street, which is insane in some areas. Um, the manholes are overcrowded. When you try to get into a manhole, you have all these um, fiber cables, you know, all over the manhole, splice cases. You can't even get into the manhole. So from a physical perspective, um, you know, very little duck room plus very little room in the manholes. And so that means there's no real way for new providers to come into the city, and this is a real problem. So if we made the city aware of this problem, what the solutions are, I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, there's probably a lot of dead cable on the ground, but the question is who's gonna go through an inventory and remove it? You know, um, it's a lot of work, probably a lot of liability associated with that. Uh, but those are the major issues that we see right now. So for us, um, you know, I think we're fortunate to get in right now. There's, there's some space available, but I don't know for how long the space will remain. Thank you. Sure. Not that I ask, uh, Inside baseball and telecom question, but the, this, this change in regime has it changed the CLEC ISP distinction legally at all, or do you still also need to be a CLEC? Um, Stealth is not a CLEC, so we're an ISP, so we operate as an information service provider um, today. So we don't really provide any telecommunication services. So our two main services are internet connectivity for businesses, and second, we provide dark fiber. You know, uh, you need CLEC status if you wanted this. No, no. I think we would need to see like we needed to attach to Verizon, for example, to provide voice over IP services, um, and even providing transport services like let's say point to point Ethernet service. We're not subject. We don't require C like licensing for that. But I think we do have an obligation at that point then to register with the state PSC because now we're providing a telecommunication service. Okay. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, published the lessons learned or a model document? Um, I have not, but I, when I met with uh, different foreign delegates, you know, from other countries, uh, when they were asking us for about our experience about running fiber and what they could do in their local countries, my suggestion was um, that the condu a conduit system, just like here in Manhattan, needs to be constructed, but it needs to be owned and operated by the city, because really the underground conduit systems, in my personal belief, should be owned by the city and operated by the city. It's just like the public roadway. You don't have a private entity, you know, um, handling the roads. You know, so I think, again, if the conduits were owned and operated by, let's say, DOT here in the city, you know, it's part of the standard roadway, and they would probably do a lot better job 
um, in terms of keeping up with the maintenance uh, of it and adding additional capacities as they see fit. Um, remember, Empire City Subway is owned by Verizon. I'm not saying that Verizon is not funding them appropriately, but still, it's very expensive for any one entity to maintain this massive underground condo system. So um, I think it needs to be reconsidered, you know, whether or not this is the appropriate model or not going forward. But anyway, going back to the delegates, when, I, when I've been speaking to the foreign delegates, so I tell them, again, you know, construct a condo system, have, the, have a city owned and operated, make it very cost effective, and build ducts into all the buildings. So you have one owner operator of underground conduits, and so provide, they can have as many partners coming into the system, and all they have to do is pull their fiber through all the ducts. And now, voila, you will have dozens and dozens of providers easily getting into business. No one has to do any trenching. New York City is tough. Like, we can pull fiber in and out ECS, but when we need to get into buildings, we have to trench the last 20 to 50 feet. That's thirty to eighty thousand dollars. You know, it's a very expensive. Yeah, question from back. Are, are the uh, steam tunnels available uh, as a future uh, source? Um, I'm not sure about that. I haven't asked them that, but I know the city's told me that uh, that um, that you know there are a lot of options on the table. So we would just have to go to the authorities who own that or have that right away. But um, I know right now the two main right away, actually three, the three main right away is the MTA tunnels. They have, uh, you know, right away uh, pathways for fiber. You have the, obviously the Empire City subway system, and then we also have the Con Ed system here in Manhattan. And then, uh, and we can also construct our own system if you wanted to, but again, you know, it's a very expensive proposition. You're gonna spend probably upwards of $400, of, you know, creating your own mainline duct system. As part of your franchise agreement with the city, do you have to turn over a certain percentage of, uh, of dark fiber? Yes. Uh, so on top of the fees, mm -hmm. we have to provide, um, I think, 10% of our capacity up to eight fiber strands. Mm -hmm. That's public knowledge. Mm -hmm. I can find out that for you. But it's something like that along the lines. Right. To the city of New York. Do it. If he goes to do it. Um, I mean, they're the ones who would make the request if they needed the capacity reserved for the city. Okay. okay. So I think we're good. So, oh, yeah. No more. Okay. Oh, okay. We're good. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I think you're next on the, the roster here. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, So we have two microphones. One is for the, the screaming, and uh, the other is for the room. So we need to use this. And if it's just to speak into this and that. Yeah, right. right. I'll just let me just quickly. Okay. Next, we have Hunter Newby of Allied Fiber, who is building out a dark fiber network, and he'll explain uh, why that's different than a conventional ISP and why it offers more freedom and options uh, for everybody. Thank you. This is a little awkward. Thanks, David. Um, my name is Hunter Newby. I'm the founder and CEO of Allied Fiber. He's going to do that. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, and thanks to the uh, New York Internet Society for uh, inviting me to speak again. It's my fourth time, and I do enjoy it. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview on Allied Fiber. And actually, uh, I find this um, sort of serendipitous that I get to come up here and speak after my good friend Srihari Pandit. Um, and we find ourselves both doing something very similar. Um, Shihari and I first met um, in the late 90s at 60 Hudson Street when I was just getting started with uh, Telex and he was just getting started with Stealth. And um, Shihari became a tenant of mine at Telex uh, at 60 Hudson. Um, and we've built a few things together uh, over the years, the voice peering fabric, the Big Apple peering exchange, uh, et cetera. And we're continuing to work together um, on different things that you saw in the slides prior. Um, Trihari was showing 325 Hudson Street, and he mentioned my name a couple of times. So in my personal private life, I'm an investor, and I buy carrier hotels with uh, real estate partners. And I've bought a few pretty important buildings here in the US recently. Uh, one of them is 325 Hudson Street here in New York. Um, not that I'm up here to talk about that, but I just wanted to make reference to it since Trihari brought it up. And, um, the Allied Fiber System, as I'm about to get into, will eventually have a presence in New York, and I'd say there's a pretty good chance that um, 
it'll have a presence at 325 Hudson Street. So anyway, as an overview of Allied Fiber, you see here two images, basically, one superimposed upon the other. One is what we call the superstructure, which is the routing around the United States, and the other embedded in that is the cartoon. You probably can't see the whole cartoon image uh, exactly, but um, the cartoon basically depicts, in a general sense, the various network elements that uh, comprise the Allied Fiber system. So there's a submarine cable landing point, which is that sort of brown little building with the two blocks on the water part and the, the cartoon in the middle. And then you see two, two lines, a blue line and a red line. There's an express cable, and uh, then there's a local lane. Um, those are for basically two different fiber cables. Uh, and then the first little building to the right from the subsea landing point, that would be an allied fiber co-location facility, which I'll get into uh, explaining a little bit more detail. Um, and then you've got a cell tower, and then you see the two lines go through a carrier hotel there. That would be representative of a building like a 325 Hudson or one Wilshire or the Weston building or the Knapp in Miami or whatever. And then you've got uh, smaller buildings, um, enterprise, schools, hospitals, sheriff's departments, etc. See the little stubs on, on the outside of the red line? Those are uh, access points to uh, handholds. And a handhold is a physical junction point on the fiber cable that's buried. Um, and that's for splicing on a lateral basis. And essentially, the three elements that, that we, we have are the fiber itself, the Allied Fiber Colo facilities, and the handholds. Our handholds in the state of Florida, which is down there in the blue, which is built now, uh, are spaced every 5,000 feet. Um, and then north of Jacksonville, the handholds are every 3,000 feet. That just has to do with the right-of-way deals and the railroads that we've worked with. Um, but in any case, the superstructure here uh, depicts we call it a ring. Obviously, it's railroad right away, so this is a very specific route. This is actually the right of way. So that's been determined since the Civil War in most cases. Um, but it connects the submarine cable landing regions in the US. So you have the transatlantic up in the New York area, uh, the, the LATAM South American cable systems between Boca Raton, which is sort of represented by the Miami dot, um, and North Miami and Hollywood. And then, of course, Jacksonville, where there's two new submarine cable systems being built presently. And then out on the west coast, you got the Pacific Northwest, um, which is the Nandona Beach and Puget Sound cables that land basically in Hillsborough and, and go back into Seattle and Portland. And then in uh, Southern California, um, you've got Grover Beach, uh, San Luis Obispo, Hermosa, and uh, they go into one Wilshire. So basically, these are the bookends of the US, and this is how the world works at the physical layer. Um, the subsea systems land there, they connect, and they crisscross the country. Presently, there is no system like Allied Fiber in the United States. I'm not a carrier. I don't sell lit services. I'm in the real estate business. So strictly dark fiber and strictly neutral colo in my own buildings every 60 miles. And I sell fiber and colo to any network operator that wants it. So I'll begin with safe harbor. No, you don't need that. That's for somebody else. That's when I'm out raising money. I'm not doing that today. I'm going to give you some industry basics. I'm going to cover who I am, who's Allied Fiber, what the big picture is, what are we building now, and then what's next. And then we can get into some Q&A. Some real basic things. Um, I don't need to go into great detail here with you guys on this, but I will point out just a couple of things. Um, not, not all fiber networks are created equal, and that largely is due to the fact that fiber as a term is sort of overused and abused. Uh, a lot of people believe wrongly that there's a fiber glut in the United States and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the fiber that's out in the long haul in the United States is all carrier owned, 100%. Um, therefore, by definition, it means it's not carrier neutral, which means that it's not available for lease or IRU on reasonable rates, terms, and conditions. What does that mean? If you can't get access to the dark fiber and light it yourself, then you're subjected to buying lit service, which means that you can never get to the same cost per bit and control that the owner of that fiber can. And in the long haul in the United States, it's owned by a single digit few network operators, mostly the incumbents. So that's a very constrictive thing for any country, and it limits uh, GDP growth, period, full stop. Um, Network neutrality 
And I've been using the term carrier neutral since the late 90s uh, when we created Telex at 60 Hudson Street. Um, but net neutrality has become a popular term. And uh, again, uh, the use of words and terms that have really no meaning, they're either uh, intentionally confusing or they're just you know repeated and parroted by the blissfully ignorant that don't understand what they mean. Net neutrality is not um, internet neutrality, it's network neutrality. And the distinction there in those two terms, network and internet, really comes down to access to me. So network neutrality is about access to the internet. It's not about the internet. And uh, as Sri Hari mentioned, and I'll repeat, what I'm about to describe to you, you have to bifurcate consumers and users and everyone else, so network operators. Um, consumers are hostages to service providers that provide them service. And you can only be free if you can bypass that control and get to a neutral interconnection point. So it's really not practical or feasible for an individual using a mobile phone to think that they could build their entire own mobile phone and mobile phone network to not have to be subjected to a mobile phone provider. Um, but a network operator, and that again is a very general broad term, um, a network operator, for example, not a carrier or a service provider, but uh, a content company, a bank, a gaming, whatever, um, you know, NYU. NYU could get dark fiber from Trihari, lease it here in Manhattan, come on over to 325 Hudson Street, set up its own DWDM, its own ethernet switch, its own router, and could directly connect to any network at once. The, uh, using internet protocol, not the internet, and directly pass IP packets to another IP network. There's no internet at all involved in any of that, and there, there's no uh, access provider other than Trihari who'd be provisioning dark fiber in this instance. So then therefore there are no active elements. So that means that there's no metering, there's no deep packet inspection, there's no blocking, there's no discrimination, there's no net neutrality. It's gone, it doesn't exist. So net neutrality only exists for those that allow themselves to be subjected to it in the network operator world. And the difference between being subjected to it and not is simply enlightenment and then physical access. Once you know, you need to know where to go and then you need to know how to get there. And if that path doesn't exist, someone needs to build it. But if it does exist or a little piece maybe is missing and you build that extension, then you can get into a system like Triharis or a system like Allied Fiber on a national basis. Essentially at the dark fiber level, we're doing the same thing. The only thing that I do that's different is that light over a great distance needs to be amplified, which is why I add those buildings. And I make those buildings neutral and I open them up to the local market. So I can have every local muni network and cable company, wireless provider and so on, come into that system and access all the long haul providers, the superstructure, the PTTs, the subsea networks, the IXEs, et cetera, and the content providers. Um, at the physical layer, when you create a new it creates an environment of openness. And as long as the rules that govern that infrastructure are based upon fairness, equality, and openness, there's no need to go any further. Um, and the rules that the FCC, well, whatever the net neutrality rules were or aren't or are being changed to is necessarily irrelevant outside of the physical layer system that we're creating because our rules created by us and they're, we're self-governed in a sense. I don't need a carrier license to do what I do because I don't sell that service. I'm strictly real estate. So that sort of uh, protects me from all the other things that go on outside of my walls. So that's what I think of when I think of neutrality. And then what is a meet me room? It's been around for a while. It's kind of a common term. I, I don't know if I created it or heard somebody say it, but I really branded it. Um, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, I am a builder and developer of Meet Me Rooms. That's what I do. And I build these facilities, and I now, with Allied Fiber, physically distribute them around the United States. And I also buy, again, as my private personal self, I invest with partners and buy carrier hotels. And in those buildings, we build Meet Me Rooms. And those are the safe, neutral havens for systems like my own on the Allied side to find and interconnect in within those markets. So here's a little bit about the cartoon and some details about Allied Fiber. Allied Fiber is building the first integrated network neutral co-location and dark fiber company, okay? And when I say integrated, I mean neutral 
COLOs, which are essentially the op-amp ILA regen facilities of the legacy IXE networks. But since I'm not a carrier, my buildings are neutral meet me rooms. And they're spaced every 60 miles on purpose because that's the distance that light travels in fiber before it needs to be amplified. So there's a wonderful real estate business inherent in what I'm doing, and it's dictated by physics. I didn't just pull that out of the air. And optics, and it depends on what lasers you use. You can use erbium dope pump lasers and go 180 miles. But the traditional spacing is about 100 kilometers, 60 miles. And then, therefore, anybody that's buying a fiber pair from me on a 20-year IRU necessarily needs to take space and power from me in my building. It just happens to be that I own the building. They don't have to go find it themselves, so it's convenient. And that's a nice way for me to charge them rent every month for 20 years. So, um, so this fiber optic system offers the combined long-haul, short-haul capabilities coupled with these neutral colo facilities. The short-haul, again, is that sort of metro distribution network. So what in a metro is referred to as a manhole, I refer to as a handhole. And I've got some pictures to show you of what that actually is. But that's for lateral splicing for folks that do fiber to the tower for wireless backhaul or MSOs or any kind of muni network or LEX or private networks or government networks or all of the above, which we're dealing with all of it in Florida presently. So it provides for direct access to towers, rural broadband, service providers, enterprise government, et cetera. So this platform, again, think of this design on a national basis, enables distributed cloud computing. So in order to distribute the cloud, you have to actually have a physical platform to distribute it on. And as Srihari mentioned, it's best served if the underlying infrastructure is not owned by a carrier, but is actually neutral. And since we pass through multiple jurisdictions, I deal with railroads. I'd rather not have to deal with municipalities and governments for a variety of different reasons. It's too much paperwork. There's too many underlying rights issues to deal with. I cut a deal with Norfolk Southern Railroad, which is effectively 35 years. Okay, so I have one landlord that covers pretty much everything east of the Mississippi, down to Florida, one landlord. They have their own police department. They're a sovereign nation. And once you get on the other side of that wall, it's a really nice, cozy place to be. It's kind of difficult to get through the wall, but once you're on the other side, it's good. Um, distributed cloud is really important. And it really, just think of it as CDN or edge cache or, or cloud or whatever. Um, it's the, the servers and server clusters that are clustered in sort of places on the, in the United States. It gets too much from a single point of failure, but also from a, uh, a congestion perspective of processing. So you have latency issues and throughput issues and whatnot. And video over mobile really ultimately doesn't work um, without LTE, which is something else we'll talk about, or some other wireless technology. Uh, but it also it doesn't work effectively if you can't cache most of the content closer to where the devices are. And the Allied Fiber System enables that distribution. You'll notice on the far left, there's a modular container data center. And it's stuck right there, like a little Lego. And I did that on purpose. The Allied Fiber co-location facilities are meet-me rooms. These are layer one, two interconnect points. They're meant for dense wave, core ethernet, and core routing. That's it. They're not meant for servers. They don't have the power or cooling profile for that. They're meet-me rooms. The power and cooling profile for a data center is found in the modular containerized data center. And there's about 50 different providers of those things today. IBM, HP, Dell, whatever. Seroscale, IO, uh, Compass. A lot of my friends are in that business. So I encourage them to deploy their product along our route because it's designed to have things appended to it and they can find cheap power and land and obviously access the dark fiber, which nothing could be better. And now you can incrementalize computing and distribute it. So that's a very important dimension of what Ally Fiber does, enables. So again, as I said, it improves latency, QoS, throughput, and control. The operative word here is control. People ask me, why are you doing this? And I say, well, because there's demand. And then people say, well, who would want to buy dark fiber? And I said, well, the fiber that's out there is already being used by multiple network operators. There happens to be more network operators on the content side, non-carrier, being born every day. And they all want control. So you know, if you think of the, if you think of the over-the-top providers, the content folks that are having issues today with the whole net neutrality access thing, if they could get their own fiber paths, they wouldn't have that problem. OK, there's the answer to the question of why we're doing it. And really, this last bullet, which is the thing that I think about the most, 
Dark fiber infrastructure, and this is generic, by the way, but think about it as it applies to the United States. Dark fiber infrastructure is the basis for economic development and GDP growth, period. I don't care where you are in the world, and I deal a lot with the World Bank and IFC, and they're funding infrastructure projects exactly like this in every other country but the United States. Because they say that the United States is rich, and we're a first world nation, and I have to remind them that the United States is comprised of multiple third world nations, and we are an emerging market, okay? And, and you know, it, it pains me to have conversations with these guys. Um, and don't get me on my fiat currency soapbox, but they all deal in dollars, and they're handing out dollars to the rest of the world. I think they should worry about the dollar's value coming out of the US. Um, and if we don't build infrastructure like this, we won't get to the GDP growth that all those other countries they're funding will. Um, and it's a problem because of our geography. We're a very big country, whereas we're being compared to a lot of smaller countries by the OECD, which is unfair. We're 20 something on the list of broadband speeds and penetrations. But when you're compared to Belgium and Luxembourg, I mean, that's a joke. Luxembourg is this auditorium compared to the United States. Um, anyway, give you a little uh, statistics here. Maybe you can't really read all this, but David, feel free to give this to anybody that wants it afterwards. Um, I really break out right here the two main products, fiber leasing and co-location, and you can see how we generate money. Okay, this is a real estate business. Now, in the old days, the fiber, dark fiber IRUs, that was not a business, okay? It was not thought through. All the original IXCs that raised high yield during the bubble had to start selling off fiber assets to make high yield note payments, okay? It was a slash and burn last ditch effort to stave off chapter 11, which all of them failed to do except level three, which retrospectively they probably should have, but that's a whole nother story over drinks. Um, we generate IRU cash by selling the fibers on a 20 year basis, but then that is what seeds the colo business, which is the dimension that none of the legacy IXCs had because they're not neutral. Colo business is leasing rack space. So once you sell out all the fiber in the cables, and again, that's theoretical, I'll always go get more ducks and I'll always be able to pull out old cables and do deals and things like that, but the initial cable, you sell it out, you generate all your upfront cash, that helps you pay for the construction, and then you start to put the equipment in the op-amp regen colo facilities, and more equipment comes and more equipment comes and more equipment comes, and they just keep taking more space and power, and they keep paying more rent, and that just grows and grows. That's the telex business model. That's what I already did, and that's working really well and it was highly successful. Just that left side is the legacy afterthought of the dark fiber business that happened in the late 90s and early 2000s. When you combine the two, it's something no one's ever seen before. It's a business that funds its own construction and then creates a 20-year or more annuity on the real estate side. And as long as you don't screw up the open access neutral environment within the colo facility, it's forever. That's basically what I wanted to show you there. So this is what we refer to as the diverse network operator universe, okay? These are just network operator types that exist out there in the world and what their motivations are for purchasing dark fiber. You might not be able to read all of it, but you're all smart people, you're here in this room, right? I would say the one word that you can sort of underpin every single one of these is control. They're all experiencing enormous, massive, explosive growth. And in many cases, these network operators know that their own success will kill them if they can't get control of their costs, particularly the enterprise folks. And there's a lot of banks and insurance companies I just couldn't fit the logos of on here, but they know all too well that as they transform their businesses to being network-based businesses, their consumption of capacity is quadrupling. And that means that their OPEX is quadrupling. And they can't compensate for that. So they want dark fiber, and they go seek it. And when they seek it here in the United States, they don't find it. It either doesn't exist or it's owned by someone who won't sell it to them. Or it's so old it can't be used, or it's aerial, or it's whatever. And then they call me. And then they look at what we're building and they say, this is amazing, this is the answer. All right, I need to buy fibers from you in the whole ring right now. 
And I say, but it's not built. And then they go panic, white, and they're like, what are you talking about? They're like, when's it going to be done? I said, it'll probably take five to seven years. That's if I got all the money today and I had no obstructions. And they're shocked. I said, well, if you don't believe me, ask yourself the question. Have you been out trying to find dark fiber? Yes. Have you found it? No. There's the answer. And they're petrified out of their minds. So I started this company in 2008. I thought that that was enough lead time for everybody to get on board. Everybody's been the ostrich with the head in the sand. And now it's 2014. And a lot of the underlying dirt rights of the existing IXC fibers, the dirt rights are expiring. OK? That's a big problem. You got to renew rights with railroads for 20 years. That's a big check you got to write. A lot of these network operators don't want to write it or don't have the money. So we're running into a, a bit of an issue here in the US in terms of national infrastructure. A little bit about the evolution of Allied Fiber. Like I mentioned, I formed the company in June of 2008. And you could just sort of bounce through this. Um, I raised the first capital for the business in uh, January 2009, um, which is funny. I raised two and a half million bucks then. So to date, I've raised 50 million. Um, and that's like chump change <laughs> compared to what's necessary to build this thing out. Got the NS right of way deal done. Right of way, that's it. This is all about right of way. If you don't have the right, you're toast. It's like ECS, it's like building penetrations here in the city. You can build whatever you want, but if you can't get that last foot, it won't happen. Um, so the right of way agreement was essential for me. Anyway, as you move through, you see we had a bunch of different milestones. We, we executed you know, major agreements with MSOs and RBOX. And, we went down to Florida and bought a duct from Florida East Coast Railroad, which is the Miami to Jacksonville uh, duct that we used to build that system. So it sort of brings you up to date. And we still have a ways to go. So what's the big picture? Again, there's a bunch of slides that show that everything's just exploding. The one thing I like to point out here, um, mobile data traffic, worldwide cloud, et cetera. These arrows don't get out into the outer years, the 2017s, 2020s unless there's infrastructure behind it to support it. And we're basically all tapped out of infrastructure here in the US right now. A lot of these guys in the long haul are trying to go 100 gig. And they're having problems because of the type of fiber that they've got and the age and the core mismatch and the lack of infrastructure facilities for them to deploy their equipment in. And that's the guys that own the glass. Forget about everybody else that wants to build their own national network and can't even get fiber. So. Capacity constraints start at layer one, layer zero, technically. Um, but anyway, this is a really good driver and slides for justification and model for why we're building Allied Fiber. And uh, I like this slide a lot because, and I got to thank Rosemary Cochran at uh, Vertical Systems Group for this. Um, she pulled out uh, the statistics of how many commercial office buildings actually have fiber in the United States. And by the way, this statistic is driven by fiber alone, just the word fiber which means it's carrier-owned fiber sort of mixed in here. Um, and this is now you know, in 12. So what she told me when I saw her in Denver a couple months ago is that it's, it's up to like about 40% or so. But that still leaves 60% of commercial office buildings in the United States without any dark fiber. Actually, if I use the term dark fiber, the percentage is probably a lot higher. Because again, dark fiber is available for lease. Fiber is carrier-owned fiber, which means, yeah, it's fiber, but they're going to sell you a 100 meg circuit for whatever price they decide. Um, so this isn't a true dark fiber representation, but still, this isn't that great. Um, and if you extrapolate out the time that it took even to get to this point, it'd take another 18 years uh, for the US to reach 95% penetration of just carrier fiber in all the office buildings, 18 years. And that's assuming no new office buildings are built in that time frame. That's bad. So all this fiber gap creates a big compelling opportunity for allied fiber. And again, we're dealing with this industry issues and really geographic issues for the country itself. Um, the US is a large country, so it's going to cost a lot of money to build. And nobody really wants to do it. Carriers don't want to do it. Everybody's looking for somebody else to sell them fiber that they already have. 
Everybody wants to pass the buck. Nobody wants to spend the capex to build the infrastructure because ultimately they only want like what, four fibers, maybe a ribbon. So who's gonna do it? Who's gonna go out and get the right of way? Who's gonna build the infrastructure? Who's gonna manage the colos? Gotta be neutral, right? Nobody wants to do it. We've been running on fumes on what's out there now. The incumbents haven't built anything new long haul in the US in over a decade. There's been three new generations of fiber in that time. All the new optics that are coming out today have been trialed on the new fiber that's been made within the last three years. But none of that fiber is actually deployed long haul in the US. That's a big problem. We have capacity constraints, we have carrier control conflicts, and we've got technological obsolescence. Those are just a few of the challenges the industry faces. Allied Fiber addresses all of them. Now here's one thing we don't do. We don't do everything, okay? I don't solve everybody's problems. I don't wave a magic wand and just say, yeah, no problem. Whatever your problem is, I, I solved it. We don't build to towers. We don't build to buildings. We don't build to hospitals or whatever. But we provide a platform that's open for people to build to us. That's the point of the handholds for splicing. And then our colo every 60 miles is like taking a carrier neutral meet me room from a major city, making it modular, incrementalizing it, and distributing it every 60 miles along the route so that the whole country can have access to their own close, near, private, neutral meet point. Makes things kind of convenient. Makes the country a smaller place. That's the fun thing about the physical layer. So I got some dark fiber statistics in here, of who uses it and, and why and what. And again, it comes down to control. But if you just look at the upper right hand corner, there are options for obtaining bandwidth. Really what you want to do um, as, an, as a network entity that's consuming a lot of capacity is ultimately move to your own dark fiber. So I'll, I'll sort of make reference back to Srihari on this one. There are probably entities in New York that are just capacity constrained, capacity exhaust, they're dying. And then Srihari hopefully can get into their building and sell them a circuit. And they'll probably buy a gig to start. And their business will grow and they'll say, hey, can we move this to 10 gig? Yeah, sure, no problem. And can we get you know, 20 gig? Can we get 40 gig? And then at some point, when they start to look at how much they're paying for that, they'd say, you know what? If we could just get our own dark fiber, we could buy equipment from this vendor over here and then we could control it. Probably the cost about break even at whatever the cost per bit is when they run the numbers in their head. And then they say, but the benefit is that from whatever that break even threshold is, now we can add capacity when we want just by going into the network management system. And it's at no additional cost. Unless you need to pop a new card in the box, but really what is that ultimately gonna cost? It's incremental. Now Srihari's probably cool with that. He's probably like, hey, you want to go from 10 gig to 100 gig and you're doing some really weird, wacky stuff and you want your own fiber pair? No problem. Here, I'll just lease you the dark fiber. That needs to exist in every city in the United States and those cities and those counties and those towns need to connect to a superstructure that allows the free thoroughfare of all of that traffic on an equal basis, physical air, real estate. So between myself, the macro, and Srihari here, the New York City micro, you combine the two and there you go. Expand on it. So what are we building now? Here we go. Got to the good stuff. So we built a 364 route mile system from Miami to Jacksonville. Again, subsea landings down in Boca and then on up to Jacksonville, connecting all the systems that come up out of Latin America, South America. So we're connecting continents and this is the first leg. But remember, it's the same model everywhere we go. We just keep repeating the same. The cartoon just keeps getting repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, it's on FEC. It's completely underground. We will never build any aerial cable. We can't. Our customers won't accept it, um, which is fine. Uh, we have handles every 5,000 feet in Florida, like I said. Uh, we're providing access on the local side for rural broadband and you know muni networks and everything under the sun. I think all of it's really great and cool, and I dig it, but I don't really care. I'm kind of agnostic to it. To me, it's all just real estate. It's an entrance. It's a rack. Somebody wants to lease a fiber repair. Great. You want to cross-connect to that guy? OK, terrific. Um, and then obviously the colos is what ties it all together. You can see the little blue dots. That's where our colos are. I particularly like that West Palm Beach colo because I go down to Palm Beach and I stay at the Breakers. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a beautiful place. You gotta check it out. We'll have a party down there. Everybody can come, all right? And I'll let you all in, we'll do a tour. So then we've already built 150 miles of the Georgia segment. That was for a customer. We had a wireless backhaul opportunity with, with them and they had it with the mobile operator. Um, so that leaves about 150 miles or so uh, to complete, and then we've got to build five new buildings and drop them 
uh, to get up to Atlanta. That's our next build, which we're going to embark upon shortly. So here's some pictures. Um, Trihari had pictures, so I've got pictures. The top right picture there is a picture of the Allied Fiber Colo, the modular building being dropped in Fort Pierce, Florida. Um, so that building is 1,200 square feet, it holds about 60 racks, and that's the same exact building you see every 60 miles. That guy's standing in a handhole. Remember I mentioned the handholes? That's a splice point, and you can see that backhoe right there is excavating one of the handholes out. And you can see some more of the work, the guy's in a handhole there, and some of the details about the Florida construction. Some more pictures. So each of those units, that one that's hanging in the air right there, that's 70,000 pounds. Uh, they're all Hurricane 5 rated. Uh, they're all AC, UPS, 120 volt, negative uh, 48 DC, redundant generator back, neutral facilities. You can see the handhole there that's open. The duct is in there, um, jetting. That was in Bunnell, Florida, up near Daytona Beach. I was there for both of these. And you can see the, the little tractor there pushing the dirt over the handhole. There's a little timeline on our construction. All that is to say that it takes time to build infrastructure, okay? <laughs> These things don't get turned up like VLANs. You gotta actually dig holes in the ground and put fiber in. Oh yeah, I always like to tell people, you talk about the cloud, that's the cloud right down there under the ground. And then what's next? We're gonna build Georgia, and then we're gonna build the superstructure. And uh, like I told somebody here earlier today, I'm always raising money. I'm always looking for lower cost of capital, access to capital. Um, but we have a sort of uh, rinse repeat type business model. It works everywhere we go. Uh, just keeps repeating the same process. Thank you. I'll take questions if people have questions. Yep. I'm wondering why the uh, railroads didn't want to give you all the money you needed because they need money. Well, that's a good question, but they're not in this business. And actually, I got to thank Norfolk Southern and uh, a couple people over there that invested a lot of money in the 90s to put the duct in the ground that I went back and essentially acquired from them. And for that, if that's all that they ever did, I thank them. They saved me, you know, untold millions. Um, but it's not their business. And they look at me as filling a void because a lot of people come to them and ask for fiber and then say they want to build what we're building, but they don't. They then look at it and go, oh my God, that's not what we are. We don't want to build all that infrastructure. We just want a few fibers in a rack every so often for amplification. So that's, that's the spot that we fill. And the railroad is our landlord. R railroads are landlords, essentially. Um, even though there's trains and they're moving coals and car and stuff like that, they're really about land. Um, so we're using the land um, to perfect it in a way to position it for network operators, that's all. And they enjoy the fact that we do that. So anytime people call them up and ask, they say, just call Allied Fiber. So it's nice. Yes? I found that in Washington, the secret intelligence world is clueless about big data and dark fiber. And the NSF is impotent. Is there any point in Washington where they might understand what you're saying? Depends on who we're talking to. Yes, but they can't do much about it yet. There's other things happening in Washington right now that are distracting. Yes. Okay, we, we have one speaker lined up who has to leave shortly. If we, okay. could, if we could pop him in. Yep. And then um, Bruce and Clayton would speak, and, and their stuff is relevant to yours. Sure. And then maybe we could bring you all back for a panel and, and do um, a deeper Q&A after That's that. Great Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to do the intro? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Hi. Okay. All right. That works. Done. Okay. Yeah, that works. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. If we could borrow your laptop, that would be really good for a very short presentation, which is on the web. Um, so yeah. All right. You can. Now this is Hunter's. Yeah. Right. So we want to get rid of that. Hey, Nate. Um, okay, so, um, okay, we just need to get onto the web. And 
the safari which is now and for the picnic dog. Ah, okay. You are not gonna be the internet. Oh where's that dark fiber? Yeah, I don't think I thought it's my fiber. <laughs> Top secret password for God. Did we write it down? No. Okay. Do you have an internet connectivity on your laptop? Uh, yeah, there's a problem with this, uh, but I can also, I mean, I can connect my phone. That will do it every time. Uh, he will. Uh, he is him. <laughs> Okay, okay, why don't you uh, quickly give uh, a sure. okay. Uh, okay, next uh, we have uh, running late and a little crazy here. Um, uh, we have Nate Heasley of Good Nick, which uh, I'll be the spoiler here and tell you what, what he's going to say. Um, Nate has uh, created a digital a labor backed digital currency and has a uh, organization Good Nick, which is a community of nonprofits and so, uh, startups with a social mission, which use this digital currency to exchange services uh, and basically uh, to empower them so that they can, even if they're limited in terms of cash, uh, uh, cash flow imme immediately as they're starting, uh, can connect and provide each other with services and with mentoring. So. Hi. Both, 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 both mics? Okay. So, um, Thanks for uh, sticking around. I'm the sort of, uh, think of me as, as the sort of uh, palate cleanser in between a series of people talking about uh, fiber and some serious science and technology that goes into powering the internet. I'm on the lighter side. So I'm talking about uh, what I do and some of the things that I've been working on with the organization that I created called Goodnick. So let me give you a, a little brief overview of what Goodnick is and then I'll get into this platform that I'm launching um, that I'm hoping to get some support from you 
around. Um, so I started an organization about a year and a half ago called GoodNIC, and we are a support network or resource organization for social entrepreneurs and nonprofit organizations. Um, we, when I say social entrepreneurs, I include both for-profit, nonprofit, and those folks who really haven't even thought about the question about what their business model is. We are business model agnostic. Um, so what do we do? We provide a variety of resources for social entrepreneurs, and that includes uh, various programs, workshops, seminars, hackathons. Uh, we have an upcoming unconference that we're putting together uh, that will be happening in July that is going to be called the Social Impact Super Collider. Um, and those are the kinds of activities that we do on a regular basis. Uh, the cornerstone of the organization right now is what we call the Good Nick in Residence program, where we partner with co-working spaces around the city who donate space to Good Nick, and then we, in turn, pair them with social entrepreneurs who need office space uh, in order to get their businesses off the ground. And that's really what Good Nick is about, is providing those infrastructure resources, um, that sort of key assistance at an early stage when an organization or a business is trying to get off the ground and may need a little bit of help in terms of finding the resources that they need. Um, so that's what Good Nick is about. All right. Um, so what I've been working on most recently and what I'm here to sort of uh, give you an early preview of is what I call the Good Nichols platform. And is this feedback that's happening? Um, so the Good Nichols platform um, is about creating an alternative currency uh, specifically to support social entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs who want to help them. Um, so what's the problem? The problem is that social impact organizations and uh, many other nonprofits often have more time than they have money. Um, and they have a difficult time identifying the professionals that they can work with who are willing to work with them at the budget that they have. Um, and so it makes it very difficult for them to get the support they need. Um, on the other side, there are many professionals who want to contribute to social impact organizations, but who want to make sure that their impact is valued, that, their organiza that the organization that they're working with is actually going to be uh, helped in, in a very tangible way, um, and that they, as a service provider, are going to get something out of that relationship. Um, and that's really why Good Nichols was created. Um, so Good Nichols is a time-based alternative currency system that allows impact organizations to effectively hire professionals at a market rate and then have those people do work for them and then those people get paid in the alternative currency which they can then in turn use to hire other professionals to work with them. So uh, in, this, in this diagram it shows uh, how the good nickels enter the system. So an impact organization gets a grant or a loan for uh, a certain amount of good nickels. These good nickels are then uh, taken by the impact organization who then uses them to hire some kind of professional. In this case, for instance, a web developer. Um, so if a nonprofit organization decides that they need a new website, they get some good nickels, they go out and they hire a web developer. That web developer then in turn can say, oh, I need a new logo or a new uh, pamphlet or something uh, that I want to hire a graphic designer for. And they can then hire that graphic designer using them, those same good nickels uh, that they just earned from working with the impact org and then the designer can then hire an accountant, the accountant can hire a web developer, and the circle continues. Um, so the good nickel is uh, one-tenth of an hour of professional services. Think of it as uh, about five minutes worth of time or about the price of a beer. Um, I can't technically put a dollar value on it because of certain IRS rules. Um, but at its core, that's basically what it is. So 10 good nickels uh, is an hour's worth of service. Um, as I mentioned, good nickels are minted through some kind of service to an impact organization, uh, through any kind of professional services. And then once those uh, good nickels are minted, they then enter the currency exchange um, and the economy and then transfer between various impact organizations and uh, private sector companies. Um, so the way that good nickels then are used uh, primarily is really in support of communities. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you guys about this was because I see that the real impact of this is working within company or organizations like ISOC or other co-working spaces, affinity groups, 
uh, or co-working spaces or alumni organizations specifically to work within those organizations to support each other. Um, and that's uh, how I see Good Nichols being most effective. Um, so that is Good Nichols in a nutshell. And so I will answer a few questions if anybody has any. Um, the, by the way, most people should have gotten some Good Nichols. If you haven't, there's a, a wooden Good Nickel outside that you can get. Um, that's, there's a code on the back that you can then use to uh, redeem at beta.goodnickels.com and we'll give you a free account balance of some good nickels to start. So the first question in the back. So how are you funded? Uh, I am funded, uh, pretty much this entire project is funded out of my own pocket. Um, good Nick as an organization has been sort of a passion project of mine that only, you know, sort of more recently took on more responsibility and, and is in need of more funding. Um, but right now, it's com completely self-funded. Is there another question back? Um, I don't yeah. understand oh, how this would work in the case of things like taxation laws, labor laws, where um, in the exchange of services normally, um, New York City, New York State, IRS, they want a percentage, they want the whole concept of wages, and there's a income, et cetera, and I just don't see how that you, you get around that system. Yeah, that is true in general. Uh, however, this is what is called a time bank. And the time bank exists under specific IRS rules that uh, es essentially exempt it from that kind of requirement. Uh, my understanding, and you'll have to check with your accountant on this uh, and your lawyer, but um, my understanding is that if you're exchanging an hour's worth of your time for an hour's worth of somebody else's time, whether you use a, a currency to keep track of who's doing what for whom or not, that is exempt from any kind of taxation. So this is not like Bitcoin. Uh, this is not like a barter exchange where you're transferring services for goods or one kind of good for another good, which has a market value. As long as it's kept within a time-based transfer, it's exempted from those kind of rules. Are you plugged into our world? I am not. Um, our worlds, I don't. Okay. Um, H O U R worlds dot org. Okay. They um, they they've taken all the different time based currencies and tried to turn it into something that's replicable. Um, how many um, how many users do you have? Right now, we're working with a beta group of about thirty different organizations that have started uh, projects on the site. So if you go to beta .com, com you'll see some of the profiles of people that have started using the product. So it's more geared for organizations, although it could be certain individuals, but... Um... Well, the primary purpose of the platform is to support social entrepreneurs and impact organizations. So those are the companies that we're starting out with. As the system grows, more professionals join the system. They can support each other by doing professional services for each other. Um, a certain percentage of the economy is always going to go to supporting, through grants or loans, some kind of impact organization. If, if you had to guess how many social entrepreneurs are in America, what do you think? Uh, 8.4 million. Right on. Um, I, I say it's somewhere between 5 and 10 million, but it, people start uh, to so argue. I think, we're, and, but, I think we're right on, on those. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, and there's 100 million, give or take, conscious producers. There's one out of four people that are like low lifestyles of health and sustainability, that they walk or bike to work and they let, lessen their footprint on the earth and they, you know, they're, they're trying to create some sort of a holistic approach. And uh, there's 40 million people that are in business for themselves and I, there's 10 million social innovators, social entrepreneurs. And if there's 100 million people stepping into a um, conscious production, where we're making a shift from generation to generation wealth industrial to information idea and from unconscious consumption to conscious production, those of us that have that platform. Anyway, um, so your, your hope is to grow the beta from here, theoretically? That's right. So, so one of the reasons I'm, out, I'm doing this outreach is because I'd like more people to uh, experiment with the system, sign up for a profile, um, and if you have an interest in, in uh, creating a project or, or um, doing something within the system, happy to talk to people offline, email me at Nate. Dot, uh, sorry, Nate at goodnick.org, um, and I'm happy to talk with people about grants and loans to kind of get this uh, off the ground. Um, this, by the way, is just a quick kind of overview of what the site looks like. Um, people posting projects, specifying what it is that they're 
working on, what their cause is that they're supporting, what skill they're looking for. Um, that's how the sort of system looked um, not perfectly represented on this particular screen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, no more questions? Thanks. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh. Did you have a quick, yeah, uh, quick question? Uh, thanks oh, so sure. yeah thanks so much I, I was wondering if uh, if uh, what, what if somebody wanted to to for instance I've, I've looked a lot at, at LETS or local exchange exchange trade systems is this akin to that is this a, is that a service you you provide if, so, if a community wanted to start their own I, I'm starting my own currency for a community it's similar in a lot of nature I'd like to either be able to partner with or or, or, or be some kind of like uh, I don't know if you, you offer franchising or or so or, it, or within the system like, or, or and or if you could open source some of the lessons you've learned on the way thank you yeah. so much so I'm, I'm currently examining what it takes to open source the software so I need to look at open source licenses and and what that means in terms of limiting um, you know I obviously want to this to be out there and usable by the community, but I want it to be uh, not co-opted or, or abused by other parties who are outside of this community, right? Um, in terms of partnerships and, and other currencies exchanges, um, I'm happy to talk to anyone about partnerships and figuring out a way to make that work. Obviously, there's some complexity when you're trying to marry one currency with another, um, especially when it comes back to IRS rules. Um, if it you know starts to fall into a barter exchange or some other um, sort of virtual or, or similar to a cryptocurrency kind of system, it could be problematic. Um, as the system stands now, anybody can create a community within this and trade exclusively within that community. So if somebody wants to start their own ISOC community specifically and work within the system and only trade with people who are in ISOC, that's certainly possible within the system. And the good nickels would be the currency that they would use, but they would sort of maintain that within their community specifically. Um, Outside of that, you know, if you want to have some other currency kind of coming into the system, that's where it gets more complicated. Are, are all trans transactions transparently logged? Uh, no, all transparent, all uh, transactions are not transparently logged. So right now, it's a very minimal product, um, and I've got an admin backend, and I can see what's going on, but um, there's no external ability to audit that system at this point. Thanks. Um, have you um, tried? Have you tried to connect with um, PopTech or, or TED or TEDx or any of the, I mean, if there's 8.4, you said. Uh, I made that number up, just, okay. to, just to be clear. Well, yeah. five, between five and 10, we, I think. Between, between five and 10. Yeah. And, and um, if you, all the usual suspects, um, Green America and, and TED and TEDx and PopTech and Good.is and Idealist and you know, that there, there's, it wouldn't be that hard to identify those 8.4 million people don't know about each other, and we certainly don't know around that. Right. Them. So those of us that can use all of our influence right here, right now, all at once, could, could pretty much create a demand for our services as our... Absolutely, yeah, and I'm looking to get this in front of as wide an audience as possible, because the more people using it, the more valuable it is to everybody who's part of the system. Um, I'm going to be presenting at New York Tech Meetup next month, um, so you. I'm going to have that beginning of a larger audience, and that's why uh, it's important that if you're interested in using the system, help me sort of get it going uh, before New York Tech Meetup, and then hopefully we can find some people to work on your projects and help you guys out. Have you tried to think about tying it into a Bitcoin? No, that's where it gets really complicated. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right now I'm just looking at, at just maintaining this as a time bank and That's certainly, that's certainly an option. Yeah. So in the future, there are other opportunities. I would, I would like to explore ways in which good nickels could be used to pay for classes, pay for meetups, pay for conferences like this one, uh, that they might be used to pay for co-working space, that they might be used to pay for beer, which is, I think, ultimately what everybody's goal is with <laughs> any alternative currency. Um, so down the line, I'm hoping that there are going to be opportunities to do that right now as we launch this and kind of get this beta going, it's really just an early stage. All right, thanks, Jeff. Actually, he's going to need to take his laptop, so we're going to switch quickly from one. Yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, no problem. Okay. All right, so we're going to need just a couple of minutes here to get to the next uh, thing set. Yours is working, right?
This annoyingly uh, doesn't come back, so I can connect it. Okay, so um, Do it out this way because I can actually observe. So you want to go to the, you know, the website? Uh, setting up, we're going to pop in a quick presentation. Um, Seema will be speaking about open data. And let me just hand it over and, and background this. Yeah, great. Hi, my name is uh, Seema Shah. Um, I am the Director of Partnerships for the NYC Big Apps Competition. Has anyone here heard of Big Apps at all? Uh, it has a green light. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I don't know how to turn it on. Then. That's okay. That is on. That's on. Oh, it is on. It is on. Okay. I, I'll just project a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Seema. I'm Director of Partnerships for the NYC Big Apps Competition. Are you guys familiar with Big Apps? Is anyone familiar with it? Um, so it is the world's largest open data competition supported by the city of New York. Um, essentially, we launched the competition about two weeks ago on May 7th, and we're encouraging entrepreneurs, developers, coders, marketers, and designers to build the best civic app and submit it on the website at nycbigapps.com to be eligible for $100,000 in financing um, and almost half a million dollars in support to help help your potential idea become a real business. So this is the first year that we are actually also integrating hardware devices. So if you have physical kind of connected devices that you'd like to submit into the competition, please feel free to do so, as well as mobile apps, games, and specifically data technologies and data tools. So again, the website is nycbigapps.com, um, and you can also reach out to me uh, on Twitter or by email. So that's it. Just wanted to let you guys know that the competition is alive, so appreciate it. Thank you. Um, sorry, my Twitter is at Seema Shah, NYC, which is S E E M A S H A H N Y C. And my email is S Shah. Uh, actually, you could just email info at nycbigapps.com. It comes to me anyway. So, info at nycbigapps.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, 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 great. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Very quickly here, we have Bruce Lincoln, uh, Clayton Banks from Silicon Harlem. And do you want me to do the video here? Uh, yeah. 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 We'll do the video. That'll introduce it. Okay. okay. All right. Let's see here. And we'll talk a little bit about what we do in there. And yeah. And a local group is making a push for Harlem to become the next Silicon Valley, yeah. and they've got some support from a diverse set of movers and shakers in the tech okay, so world. Our Tracy Strahan has more, and it's more this positively black. Okay. So, this is for the streaming video, so you have to use both microphones. Some of the major right. players in the tech industry have come to talk about urban innovation in one setting, Harlem. Big wigs from Microsoft and Samsung have recently participated in tech talks headed by a group called Silicon Harlem. The goal here is to empower urban communities through the use of technology. Clayton Banks and Bruce Lincoln are the executive producers of Silicon Harlem. We're so glad you're here. Clayton, I'm going to start with you and the mission statement for all of this. This is a lofty thing, urban innovation to Harlem. So is this the next Silicon Valley we're talking about here? That's the idea, <laughs> and thanks for having us, Tracy. No love, problem. Love your show. Uh, Silicon Harlem has one clear mission. We want to transform Harlem into a technology and innovation hub. Mm -hmm. And what that essentially means is you'll see incubators and co-working spaces and accelerators and investment capital all surrounding Harlem to bolster our startup community, to help our established businesses, and to move the community towards a tech and innovation economy. Uh, a lofty go, but Bruce, a lot of your members come from sort of a tech background. Who are some of the people that are participating in the group now? Well, we work closely with Around the Way, which is Janine Hoseef and Eric Hamilton, who developed um, an app that lets you identify minority-owned businesses based on your location. We also work closely with um, Emily Stewart of Stewart Films, which is a digital film production organization, as well as with the Harlem Film Company, which is a digital studio that's um, being built now and will be housed within um, Miami Studios, where we hold our Tech Talk events. Uh, let's roll some video of some of those Tech Talks, because you've had a lot of big wigs, as I mentioned, come out and speak to people. What have some of the audiences gleaned from their information? It seems like you had some packed houses there. Well, one of the things that was recently shared by Microsoft is that 80% of the jobs um, by 2020 are going to require a technology background. Wow. So in order for our inner cities and urban markets to thrive, we have to start emphasizing things like STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math education. Mm -hmm. Getting our children prepared early in life so that they will be prepared for the careers of the future. And we're looking at already 1.2 million jobs out there that the youth are to be prepared for that are STEM related. And those jobs are right now uh, very much are going untapped because right. of our background. So we need a lot more work in the uh, STEM area, and that's one of the things Silicon Harlem focuses on. Well, your name is Silicon Harlem, and a lot has been made about wiring Harlem, getting the Wi-Fi going, and trying to closing the technology gap that exists. How are you guys participating in any of that? And I imagine a lot of people have asked you about that, too. Well, we have an initiative called Gigabit Harlem, mm -hmm. and the idea being that we're going to work closely with Verizon, with Google, and the idea is to put in the next generation internet, which is similar to what Google Fiber has done in Kansas City. So we want to do that in Upper Manhattan, mm -hmm. make sure you not only have the next generation internet as far as the fiber, but also the very high speed wire, so in essence you have ubiquitous access to the internet, especially with the young people, you know. Wi-Fi like oxygen to them. Absolutely, they need it to breathe. We want to let everyone know for more information on the group, you can go to the website siliconholland.net. Thank you both so much for being here. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the public affairs presentation from NBC for New York. Positively flag. I'm so happy I'm wearing a different suit today. It would have been embarrassing to have the same suit on when you saw on the video. And we need to give a shout out to Jolie, who is um, a good partner and uh, has been videotaping our events. So I want, what I want to do is briefly talk about the four pillars on which we stand, and then that can turn into a discussion talking about um, sort of the next generation internet, the deployment of fiber, and then the kind of things that makes possible when you look at the uh, creation of an innovation economy. And basically, Silicon Harlem, which is now one year old, rests on four pillars. The first one is the gigabit infrastructure in Harlem to ensure that we eradicate the digital divide 
and put in place the kind of infrastructure that can support the growth of the tech community. We have one of the fastest growing communities when it comes to the location of tech startups. So that infrastructure is very important. The result we would want to achieve is creating an innovation economy in Harlem. And then sort of the other two pillars revolve around STEM literacy. One, increasing STEM literacy among our high school students, as well as middle schoolers and hopefully, ultimately, uh, younger students. But then the creation of STEM entrepreneurship opportunities. And sort of towards that, within this ecosystem we've set up, we've raised funding to create the first STEM incubators called the Apps Youth Leadership Academy. So what we're going to do is recruit 20 10th and 11th graders, teach them how to develop smartphone apps, but also build businesses around that and then seed fund those businesses. So that's in essence, in a nutshell, what Silicon Harlem represents. Early today, we were part of a panel at the Internet Week uh, conference at the uh, Metropolitan Pavilion. And there we talked about this idea along with Andrew Roger and Maya Wiley and Andrea um, Schlesinger from the Open Society Institute about this idea of creating gigabit innovation centers so that what you can do is um, come into these centers and have the ability to um, build businesses, accelerate your, your um, apps development, and then let me hand it off to Clayton for a few comments. Yeah, just to build a little bit on what Bruce is saying, one of the things that we have found to be effective is we have, every month we have a meetup uh, taking place in the middle of Harlem at Mist on 116th Street. And that's the reason why I mentioned that. It's been very important for us to get the, to get the community galvanized around these ideas. Like many of you in this room, you've been working on broadband initiatives for probably many, many years. So have we. We've been at it since, you know, over 20 years. And one of the things that became quite evident, it's, it's nice to sit in a room with a bunch of smart people asking smart questions, writing great white papers, arguing with the government. It's great to do all that, but we have to get the people galvanized with us in order to make change. And that's what we're seeing happening uptown. As when we hold our meetups, we found out this, uh, on just any given night, we can have three to 400 people come out. And that told us we're not the only geeks uptown. There's people uptown that care about technology, that care about participation in this growing innovation economy, and they want to be a part of it. And that has made us energized, obviously, and it makes our argument to, go to the government um, that much stronger. We've had uh, a congressional sponsor in Charlie Rangel, who's come out and has been very supportive of our initiative. Not so fast, what I had for lunch. And the <laughs> other thing is, uh, we've had uh, the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, come out with uh, tremendous support. What you're seeing and what I've seen uh, is the same. The electives have broadband on their mind. Now they need us in this room to help them envision what the technological future looks like. And that's what we're trying to do with Harlem. And so part of our reason to be here today and the plea that we have is for you, to got, you, you in this room to join us at Silicon Harlem. You know, we need your help. This is a big deal. The country's at stake in a lot of ways when you think about um, where we are. And the previous presentation is talking about where we are as a country compared to others. It's important. And, 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 and um, our next event is June 25th. We'll, you know, for anyone who's interested, please see me after this. I would love for you to come. We're doing it in partnership with Google as part of their Google I.O. event. And uh, we would love for you guys to, to be, uh, be a part of this. But more importantly, on an ongoing basis, we're right now providing mentors to um, high schools in and around uptown. We're working with George Washington High School right now. Um, so we're doing everything we can to keep people focused on the fact that broadband can transform the community. If we do this correctly, what, what Bruce and I sometimes talk about, well, if we do this correctly, years from now, we'll start to see crime come down dramatically uptown. It's been coming down, but I mean coming down dramatically. Jobs increasing, education improving. The, the living conditions of our, of our neighbors will, will improve so much. We all know the power of, of broadband. So that's our plea today. We hope that you guys can get involved. And um, we'll be happy to join the panel and answer questions.
Thank you so much for what you've been doing. It's uh, it, it's definitely brightened up uh, for a lot of us. It's it's uh, it's really about engaging the entire population. And I wanted to see what what lessons you've brought back from the field and the front um, about getting people to appreciate the power and and to appreciate that we can do what we what, whatever we want with that power. Um, a lot of a lot of times people get introduced to a technology, but the technology itself seems oppressive, or the way it's been used in the past. So I wanted to see if you could speak a little bit about that empowerment. I just think the main thing is that people understand the importance of these technologies, and so. It's not the same cell as it once was. Everyone now sees it as part of how you improve your lifestyle, how you basically create opportunities as far as employment, as well as that it is the driver for economic development. So 10 years ago when we were saying this, it fell on deaf ears. Now we don't even have to say if people are coming to us about that. But we see that as part of an idea whose time and come so it's important that we're working with everyone. So I think it's important to realize that Silicon Harm is a multicultural, multiracial coalition that is meant to also work closely with Queens and with Brooklyn and with all the different groups that now see this from a grassroots activism standpoint, even tied into with Thomas and what he's doing with .NYC. All of this is tied together and more so it's about equity and it's about social inclusion. And I'll just add to your to, to part of your question of lessons learned. You know, one of the things that's been really interesting is we're finding that people in the community are starting to connect around this idea. So, and we've had uh, some of the incumbents attend our event, uh, as, as Jolie shot the, the event we had called Gigabit Harlem, and Verizon showed up, one of their top um, executives came. As a result of that event, uh, two of our businesses in the, uh, in the area were we're able to get broadband, uh, high-speed internet um, through files. So we're seeing success, people starting to embrace that. Um, and so the lessons in that is you got to get people together and you got to get them talking about this and seeing the power of, of what we all know in this room and let them sort of take control. You know, one of the things that I think is a big lesson is not to try to drive everything down anyone's throat. Let people take control, connect, and move forward, so that we're hoping to continue to facilitate that. Oh, well, and one last comment is, it's not just the techno geeks, it's the nonprofits, it's the mom and pop stores, it's artists, it's musicians, it's everyone who's running around with some kind of device and can't get enough uh, broadband or Wi-Fi knows that this is important. So that's the other power of it. You have what I call eyed bedfellows. Everyone has come together around the idea of how do we basically use this to improve our community. I have a question. Okay. As we know, um, Mayor de Blasio announced you know, the, the ongoing uh, Wi-Fi-ization of Harlem. Have you any ideas about what kind of quality and any more details of like how that service is going to work? Well, actually, earlier today, Maya Wiley talked about their commitment to the Harlem Wi-Fi. Thank you. Um, earlier today, uh, Maya Wiley talked about the uh, mayor's commitment. She's uh, senior counsel to the, the mayor. She talked about his commitment to Wi-Fi, but she also made clear that this isn't simply about Wi-Fi. We also have to make sure that the wireline infrastructure is upgraded as well because what happens ultimately is you still have issues of bandwidth degradation. Even with the Harlem Wi-Fi, with it being the largest outdoor Wi-Fi network in the country, it only goes from 110th Street to 138th Street and stretches from 8th Avenue to Madison Avenue. What kind East of speeds? What kind of speeds are people going to get on that network? Any ideas? Well, just, I've been trying to get on the network and I haven't been able to. <laughs> Right? But um, they don't talk about the speeds. Um, and like I said, it stops, hard stop, at Madison. So if you're in Park Avenue, you can't get that in East Harlem. So, but more so, I think that's important. But to me, that's symbolic because most people in Harlem are not sitting outside as far as that culture of use and trying to connect to Wi Fi. I was on 125th Street. Uh, yesterday and tried to get on that network and couldn't. I also tried to get on the free GoX network. Both networks make sure it says free, but you can't get on. I got timed out multiple times. So I think there's still some just engineering and deployment issues, but the fact that they're trying to do that after 
10 years or so that we've been trying to push these things, I think that's important. But once again, now we have to bring our expertise to help them solve those problems. We got Joe in the audience who's worked on this for the longest. And um, we now have to go back with those arguments, back with that expertise, and help them figure this out. But it is in earnest. But I was at a school. The young lady's got great Wi-Fi. Uh, at her school, but when she goes home to East Harlem, she has to use her phone. So we still have a long way to go, but we have made improvement. Okay, great. Thank, uh, thank you very much. What I'd like to do is now, okay, here I'll go. I'd like to ask you if, you if you'd like to sit down with Sri Hari and Hunter Newby and put your heads together a little bit about some ways to, you might be able to get more uh, bandwidth uh, in Harlem. Okay. Does that sound Great. like a good idea? Okay. Great idea. Okay, we're probably gonna be about one second here to move things around, okay. but I'm gonna go and get them. So we're, we're going to take a, um, a break for about a half hour or so, and um, you know, time to stretch. Um, later today, we have um, plenty more coming up. We have Groucho Fractal kicking off the show when everybody comes back. Um, Stanley Cohn, and we have our keynote speaker, um, Robert Steele. And um, we'll also be having um, a bit of a presentation about Reclaim CC and, um, and the Reclaim agenda. So, um, yeah, plenty left to come, and, um, and we'll pick up, um, I guess, about 6, 6.15. Grab some food. We'll uh, blow the oh, conchal outside are, to make it. And, and are, are you guys coming back for a discussion now? Or, or? Okay, if, and if, well, we can, why don't we do that now? Um, I'm sure that there's some questions, and I'm sure that there's some, you know, Real, real synergy between these well, groups. A, a so very short panel for anybody now, and then we'll have at least a half hour dinner break. Yeah. Panel, then break. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now you can sit down. Panel, panel. panel then break. All right. I heard that. Thanks, Joel. I wasn't sure. Yeah. What is this? Is it better for them to sit or stand? If they sit, they can just move this around the table. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, how about we slide the chair down? Yeah. How yeah. many people are there going to be? So it's going to be four people. Four people. This will be here for yourself? roving purposes. Uh, I'm gonna no, that would make it. Turn on. All right, well. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I'm going to sit. You want to sit there? You sit? Yeah. Sit. Okay. okay. One more. One more. Right. One more chair. Did you guys talk though? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Clayton just run into the men's and tennis. Clayton, you want to grab this? Yeah. The soft chair, you want to grab this one? Well, actually, I think David's going to sit in this one. Oh, okay. Well, you got it. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Don't tell me. That's for the fireside chair. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Gigabit Gigabit Wood. <laughs> Cavill or something. The, the dais. And the thing looks ancient. Yeah, yeah, right. Here you go. 
All right, so what I'd like to do now is just have a, a quick panel discussion here uh, because we have a great combination of people here. We have some people who are uh, working, uh, who are working in an underserved community in terms of bandwidth and looking to build a new tech community there. There's a lot of discussion in the group, but we right, right. can't hear David. Oh, OK. Uh, I'll talk louder and see if this works better. OK. Um, so we have a, <laughs> that This is crazy. Uh, this is crazy. This is totally yeah, crazy. Right. OK, so oh, all right. So now, okay. OK, starting again from the top. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a, a good combination of people here uh, for a panel. Uh, we have uh, uh, Bruce and Clayton who are working in an underserved community trying to build a, uh, a tech uh, community there. And we have Srihari and uh, Hunter who are building out a new uh, a, a, you know, fiber in infrastructure that allows Let's greater one, freedom, two, lower test. cost, and uh, better access. So. Uh, one, uh, you know, I think you mentioned earlier different kinds of subsidies and some types of supports that the incumbent providers have offered. But uh, in the end, I would suggest that uh, having access to direct access to your own infrastructure uh, would be more empowering and uh, in many ways. So uh, I'm just going to open it up from here a little bit and uh, and uh, open the discussion there. Okay. Yes, so. Okay. Sure. You got a question you want to kick it off with? Yeah, Anybody? okay, so the question is, okay, the question is, uh, how could, uh, in a area place like, like Harlem, uh, one build a community-based uh, uh, fiber network that would be superior to what uh, the Verizon, uh, Time Warner, Comcast, uh, Cabal <laughs> uh, would, would offer you? Okay. Well, I'll respond to that because Actually, that's been the idea all along. The original idea of Silicon Harlem, which was submitted to the Broadband Stimulus Program for funding, which it did not get funded, was to, and actually it goes, it predates that going back to, I think, 2000, was the idea that in Harlem we would want to build a dedicated network that would both have um, a wired infrastructure and a wireless infrastructure so that what you would have is a community-based broadband network. Um, and, at the time, we were working closely with uh, Columbia University and Verizon, and so there was some limitation to the kind of network that could be built. But as you've seen, as time has moved forward and you look at what um, Hunter has designed, it's possible to do that. But the economics have existed, but in many respects, because of the way the natural monopoly is set up, that favors the incumbents, so, um, as well as other sorts of things such as their ability to actually enter into uh, making decisions around who got the broadband stimulus funding. Um, so what you have is a $7.2 billion, um, as Hunter puts it, boondoggle, where they've deployed this technology. You have networks to nowhere. They have public access computing centers that don't have the ability to be sustainable. And here we are. And um, recently, you have net neutrality being gutted by Verizon. So what the issue is is that people felt that it wasn't possible, but on the engineering and economic side, it's always been possible. Um, so I'll add to that for Srihari's benefit. Uh, I'll, t I'll, I'll tee him up. This is the live stream mic, and that's the, that's the house mic. I'll try to <clears throat> project over here. <laughs> Okay. So what we were talking about was physical layer access. And through layer one, um, which to me, layer one is sort of uh, akin to physics. And like I like to say, when you're born, you are uh, you're given all the benefits that every other person on Earth has in terms of physics. You get all the same rights and privileges. Uh, you get gravity and things like that. And you're free, basically. Um, it's not going to impact you any differently than anyone else. So here in New York, um, as, it, as it relates to the macro design that Allied Fiber has, you're looking at Srihari Pandit right here, and you know he's the physical layer path to salvation, to freedom from, uh, from Harlem, which uh, you know you call it an underserved community. I would refer to it as an emerging market. It sounds like better. You know, it's optimist instead of pessimist. And I, I look at uh, I look at the United States, um, you know, let's be clear, there's, there's only one Harlem. Harlem's Harlem. But there are a lot of places throughout the U.S. 
that need access to physical air infrastructure. Um, so what we're providing open access to is to enable a lot of, you know, emerging markets and developing communities to get access to that infrastructure whereby the incumbents have for a very long time and continue to neglect because there's no competition. They don't have to do anything. But bring it full circle back here to New York since we're all from here and we're here. That's what Trihari's doing. And Trihari's up to 60th Street mm -hmm. so far. Right. And he's got, what do you got? What does that mean? You got another 100, or you got another 65 blocks to go yeah. and you get to 125. So the good news in Harlem is that <laughs> there there's, go. yeah, the good news in Harlem is that there's tons of ducks that go all the way to the tip of northern Manhattan and all the way into the Bronx. So um, it's definitely doable, I think. Um, so right now, when we built the initial network, we were just driven by where the customer demands are. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of demand in Harlem. We just haven't really looked there. and But we haven't marketed the services yet into that particular area. But it shouldn't be that hard, really, to extend the network up to 125th Street Here's and beyond. Here's your marketing department. Well, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's <laughs> worth the price of admission to come here, then, because uh, this is the relationship we're looking for. This is great. Right. It's good to hear that. Yeah. And it's good to hear what you're doing from, from a, a deployment perspective. The demand is there uptown. The demand is there in Upper Manhattan. If you haven't been, um, you can talk to Jolie. You'll see our, our uh, events are filled with people that are doing great things. Um, many of them live and work in Harlem. And our starting businesses are, like Bruce had referred to, have a variety of cultural backgrounds. You know, it's just one of those areas that, you know, we, we don't want to necessarily say it's been neglected, but we know that that same sort of argument's been presented in the past to us, which is, oh, well, we're just waiting for the demand. The demand is there. If you're not there, you don't know it, but the demand is there, just like it is in just about every part of New York. I think that uh, kind of puts it together, and uh, we're now going to take a dinner break. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Cool. Wait, well, there's a question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Can we get you a mic for the white cup? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> we got it. Get that in. Hey, I'm uh, JP Borum. Not yet, it's on. It's, okay. the, it's for the live cool. cast. Yeah. Got you. Uh, I, I teach writing here at NYU for liberal studies, but I'm not here on behalf of that program. Uh, I just, I was just up at the UN with uh, with Ted Hall and Ann Aparu, and we've been going to the the forum for indigenous uh, people. Um, there is a serious timeline to think about in terms of the Keystone Pipeline and other. Um, uh, legal, um, I'll say, documents that are being pushed through without respecting sacred sites of indigenous people. So I'm actually here for Teddy, because he's running around town doing everything. And um, I just want, he wanted to share this with you, so I'm sort of sharing for him. Um, as soon as we get back to the break, it would probably be better for that. We're talking about really, really this is focused on them. Yeah, this is about broadband, but indigenous people here in the United States certainly don't have access as well. Well, then I'm going to read you one piece uh, from that represents indigenous people. Please listen. Indigenous peoples have the right to establish their own media in their own language and to have access to all forms of non-indigenous media without discrimination. States shall take effective measures to ensure that state-owned media duly reflect indigenous cultural diversity. States without prejudice to ensuring full freedom of expression should encourage privately owned media to adequately reflect indigenous cultural diversity. This is a law passed in 2007 by the UN, and I believe it's pertinent to this discussion. Forgive me for timing, it was, it was difficult, but um, sorry to take up five minutes. Uh, I understand your pressure of timing, but this is going on right now, right now. And an indigenous grandmother told me, yep. We will be talking about reclaim and the reclaim platform um, a little later in the evening, and that is relevant to that portion of the program. Thank you. I can't stay, so I'm, I'm sorry about that, but thank you. Okay. All right. Hi, can I, can I use this mic? This is the live stream. Of course, this is an example of the brilliance of the design of user interfaces with everything connected with computers and telecommunications today. Okay, I'd like to point out that what was just said is directly relevant for, to everything that's happening here. And there's a question not only of Indian and other indigenous people's rights, there's also the following question. People say broadband, people say internet. 
Well, if you don't own the device, and you can't SSH into somebody else's machine directly, then what you are is, a friend of mine called it, you're a sharecropper on your own culture and the entire culture of the world. Um, I just want to say that talk about broadband that doesn't discuss the real meaning of internet is actually, you know, not what we want. We want people to understand the issues of licensing, ownership. I'm a free software crank. And, and the question of um, indigenous peoples, it's broader than so-called indigenous peoples. It's every human being's right to the ordinary privacy we once had sending a letter under the United States Postal Service. And that, I think, is one of the central issues. So I'm just going to say that if you say broadband and you say internet, Forget about broadband for the moment. If you say internet, you should take it seriously. And that means you should own your device, and you should be able to securely and privately communicate directly without going via Google or Facebook. And I think it is directly relevant. Thanks. Sorry, sorry for the advertisement. Oh, okay. right. <laughs> cool, it's all good. How okay. much money do you need, and what does that boil down to per family or business? Who? Arlo. Can we talk to you after this? <laughs> I have no money. Oh. <laughs> well, well, the Silicon Harlem proposal was for, was for $19 million. And what that, would have, what was that was designed to do was, one, to use a micro data center at a smart and green building we have called the Kalahari and use that as the basis for where we would then deploy fiber into 10 um, strategically located public. 20 million divided by how many families and businesses? I have no idea and I can't answer it. I'm telling That's you about. That's a good question to answer. I'm, I'm serious because it gets down to a very small number. All right. Well, I didn't get to answer your question because you interrupt me about explaining what this proposal was that I had submitted. Right, so that was one way to get at an answer, but you know, I can't sit and just tell you how many fans there are in Harlem. But what it would have done is covered all of Harlem, which is the size of Atlanta, to, so that everyone could have connected to this network for $20 million. Okay. That's okay. it. I'm like a, on that note, <laughs> yeah. I think so we are going to take a break now. It's been a yeah, it's been a while. We, we got we got some frustrated up, so activists in this room. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we, have, we have a lot that's coming up, and yeah, so if we're going to stay on schedule, we need to wrap up now, take a little break, and, okay. uh, and start back again soon. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kay. So we'll definitely be in touch, and I got it, and I'm glad you Good seeing you again. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll give you a little. But yeah, we'll. So when you hear this again, come back. Yeah. Okay, good. He's your guy. He, he, that's that's him. You get from him to me for 25 bucks a year. Yeah, you're out. Now, when you, you're doing fraud in Georgia, are you doing anything in Mississippi? Or is it? Um, we'll go through it when we go west. Yeah, but not until we go west. So the answer is yes, but it's a question of when. You have to basically go through it. Yeah, from Atlanta. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, yeah, same here. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck with everything. Yeah. We'll talk to you soon, all right? We'll make it
So,
just make sure whoever starts starts with that? <laughs> How you yeah. do it? Jeff, do you follow? Mm -hmm. uh, what was the question? About retweeting it. Anyway, so it's that we we found the thing. Good thing. And we should have a conversation about this. Gonna, that's why I want to get everybody together to brainstorm about this. The next few days are not great for Nobody's everybody's busy. You got to I
causes, the, the collective mind. Um, for instance, Occupy Wall Street was basically a, a collection of communication tools. It was a way for us to, to listen and, and to gather the, the wisdom in any p particular region. So what a lot of folks who may have not have made it down to an occupation in, uh, uh, themselves would not have necessarily seen that we had bicycle generation stations set up. We had uh, sort of the, the meta mind, the potential for one person to struggle and to have that struggle be heard and recognized and answered by the collective. That's the power we have. It's the power of esteem. It's the power of independence and autonomy. And it's the power of being able to provide mutual aid or support. So those are the basics. Right now, as, uh, as our keynote speaker, I'm very excited about here, uh, Robert Steele has, has mentioned on, on numerous occasions that the, 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 the vast amount of information that we keep from our loved ones, that we keep from the people in our household, but the banks know, and you know the, the internet service providers know what you're doing when nobody else is watching. And so if, if we can embark together in a world we're not hiding from each other, in a world based on truth, trust, and transparency, where we can practice authentic communication, where we can share the, the, the wealth of possibility from a shared standpoint. We currently are using uh, you know, the old systems, the old framework, and it, and it has limited our possibility. So what we're bringing together here are the dreamers, the folks who are ready to, uh, to answer the, 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 the numerous calls that are needed to, uh, to be able to address the, the crisis of our times. Uh, so we mentioned the XL pipeline. We, we mentioned the, the, uh, the, 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 the numerous uh, opportunities the FCC right now looking for, uh, looking for, 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 for input and, and uh, feedback. And it's a one little area we have to, uh, as a public, to have our voice heard until such time that we build this thing together. As in the words of Buckminster Fuller, what, you know, uh, build the system that makes the old one obsolete. And so we need those folks, the pioneers at the front land, and we need to understand their story. We need that thick description, that deep and a deep appreciation of, of the journeys. And so I'd like to introduce uh, a veteran attorney activist who's done uh, quite a bit uh, on, on so many fronts, and we're so glad to have him here to share his story and, uh, and, and, and to rein in on the open source imperative that we're all facing, a uh, shift in culture and a, a shift in the way that we use technology to liberate. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Let's see. Hello, hello. That's just not my screen. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, when I was asked to to speak tonight, I, I said to myself, okay, what can I talk about? What can I possibly bring to this gathering that in any way would enlighten or change or put a different context on, on this gathering and the, uh, the discussion about where we are and where we're going? And um, what I'd like to do is, is, is basically revisit a rather long interview I did last night with uh, an anonymous group called Anonymous that's anonymous in U the UK that opened uh, a new television and uh, live stream and radio network last night and we talked by Skype uh, and it's already out all over cyberspace today and we talked about a variety of issues um, and I think what's, what's important, especially when we start dealing with the future, is to have a clear understanding of the past. When you talk about criminalizing dissent, there's nothing new about it. Uh, the nature of the dissent, the nature of the threat, the nature of government response, the ability of the government to try to insinuate itself into dissent, to divide, to conquer, to penalize, to criminalize, to attack, may be evolving as well. But it certainly has roots going back to the very beginning of the Republic. And rather than deal with the first 200 years or whatever the hell it was, we'll, we'll just start out with, you know, the McCarthy era very clearly was probably the most uh, readily obvious example of the criminalization of dissent 
where the government felt threatened by a growing collective of political activists, by people who were involved in communications and productions, who had a message, had an ability to spread the message. And so then, you know, Joe McCarthy made a career out of it. Short-lived career, thank God. Uh, but people paid the price. People went to prison. Uh, in those days, they were very public. Cyberspace was there, but unused. So it was about movies, it was about speeches, it was about collective activities, it was about collective efforts. Um, and while we'd like to think uh, that the McCarthy era was, 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 was aberrant, that it's gone, it's done, it's over, it just moved its way along. Um, when we next turn a decade later or so into the explosion in the United States and in the world community around Vietnam and around the civil rights movement and around uh, challenges, traditional notions of sexuality and about gender and about roles, um, the country was ablaze, the world was ablaze, with lots of people that were threatening lots of powers in lots of different ways. And next we have COINTELPRO pops up. And it took a number of years for the for the, 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 the nature and extent of the depravity to come home with COINTELPRO. But we, we, there came a time where we learned that the government not just infiltrated, not just tried to control through harassment and through disruption and through informants, but assassinated people, developed targets of individuals who were selected, who were murdered, whose homes were raided with the understanding that people would die, and they did. COINTELPRO did not target a particular group. It did not target particular persons. It, it targeted an entire movement. Um, it took many years for us to understand the nature and extent of COINTELPRO. And there are those of us, including myself, who believe that, you know, COINTELPRO continues today right through into New York City. It's got a different name. It's got a different acronym. But the sy systematic and systemic attack upon Occupy Wall Street. What is the acronym? Hmm? What is the well, you know, there was the Hanshu Accord, which was, which was the settlement with the city over, you know, who knows? Some people call it the Joint Terrorist Task Force. Some people call it uh, the, the Domestic Security uh, Review Committee. We, we have a deputy police commissioner who at one time was an active, was still on the payroll of the CIA. When that was exposed, he was forced to now take a leave of absence. Uh, you've now got the intelligence network of the New York City Police Department going to Israel and exchanging information, monitoring people, and sharing information. So there are those of us, including me, who believe that COINTELPRO never changed. It never ended. Well, it changed. It got more sophisticated. It learned the technology. And whether it's Cebu, who is in, and the whole interesting thing about, and we'll talk about, you know, PayPal. Um, because that really sort of is the break into the next generation of criminalizing dissent. Um, last night we were talking about DDoS and the, the response of the government to DOS so-called attacks. And the response has been the government has said, this is good shit. And so what do we learn recently is that through informants such as Cebu and through other people working for the NSA and the CIA and the FBI, they've been DDoSing countries and groups and movements all over the world as we speak. So PayPal 14 um, gets selected out of thousands of people who involved in a, in a DOS activity, protected speech, political speech, political activity. They get indicted. And the next thing you know, Eric Holder says, wow, this is good shit. I like this stuff. So we now begin to see, um, through a series of leaks and whistleblowers and other programs and examinations that the government has been involved in the very sorts of activity. But of course, when the government engages in COINTELPRO, when the government engages in the activity which was exposed by the church committee meetings in, in the 1970s, when the government engages in mass surveillance, when the government engages in lying to the Supreme Court, which is blazing new land on expectations of privacy and on, and, and on standing, it's okay for them to lie. It's okay for them to, to steal. It's okay for them to use the internet for criminal and extrajudicial activity and conduct because it's the government. And that's ultimately what we're talking about here is the criminalization of dissent. Now, when you take a look, and I'm going to focus, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time tonight. I know there are bunch of folks to come after me that have much more relevant things to talk about. But what I find so significant about PayPal 14, and I was, and I am still one of the attorneys 
for Mercedes Hafer, who's one of the defendants in PayPal 14, um, a movement, an action, which clearly had its roots in the civil rights movement in the South in the 1950s, where you had sit-ins at counters. The DOS so-called attacks are nothing other than electronic sit-ins at counters. The nature of... Sure. Um, after eBay, owned by that great enlightened titan who's now set up uh, the, the new hip media outlet that Glenn, Glenn Greenwald is overseeing, um, when WikiLeaks released um, all the information that it did, including the assassinations and the murders in Iraq and in the Middle East, um, PayPal decided they were going to shut down fundraising for WikiLeaks. They were going to stop the ability of WikiLeaks and other whistleblowing groups from soliciting input, from soliciting feedback, from soliciting donations, fundraising through PayPal. So PayPal shut them down, closed them down, and thousands of folks throughout the world decided, uh-uh. Um, Sorry, we're not going to stand for this while you turn around and try to chill dissent, when you try to close dissent, and when you try to, to, to defund or at least to prevent the funding of organizations that are exposing government and corporate lies and activity, as it turns out, including PayPal and eBay. So a group of people, thousands of people worldwide, got together through the Internet and decided they were going to do a DOS on PayPal. And they did. And actually, the interesting thing is most of the dosing came from two botnets that probably constituted 90% of the quote-unquote attack. Government never found them. Government has no idea who they were. But they ended up selecting 14 people, young women and men, uh, as young as 13 years of age, uh, typically 20, 21, 22 years of age. And they charged them. Uh, first, they executed a series of search warrants. Uh, and grand jury subpoenas throughout the United States. Uh, the vests went on, the jackets went on, the SWAT teams went on, the doors were kicked in, people were dragged out. Um, and eventually they were indicted and they were charged with, long story short, they were charged with conspiracy to violate uh, protected computers uh, and causing a certain amount of damage. Now, the notion of protected computers is very interesting because it's sort of like the Commerce Clause or pornography. It is what you want it to be. Um, protective computers were originally designed for national security purposes, the statute. It was originally designed to provide some level of protection and punishment for people like Pollard, who were engaged in, quote, espionage. In fact, what's happened now is the government chooses any computer terminal, the government chooses any aspect of cyberspace communication, and, 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 and all of a sudden has described it as a protected computer. So the PayPal 14 were indicted. They were charged with serious felonies. They were facing 10 to 15 years in prison. Um, PayPal initially did a filing with the SEC saying it didn't do any damage at all to us. No damage. The, the, the spokesperson for PayPal, held a press conference and said, did no damage to us. The next thing you know, the indictment alleges $5.5 million of damage. Well, where does the $5.5 million of damage come from? PayPal turned around, and as a result of the DOS attack, they went over the system, they embraced new systems, they put new security in, they brought experts in, and then they charged PayPal, the 14, for $5.5 million. It's like throwing a rock through the window, getting arrested for criminal mischief. And then the landlord, when you settle the case, decides to build a 15-story building in front of the window and then sends you a bill for $700,000. Now, we fought the case for three years. Um, interestingly enough, we had our greatest victories with PayPal when subpoenas were granted by the court going after PayPal's financial records, going after PayPal's business records, going after PayPal's associational records. And all of a sudden, PayPal lost a lot of interest in pursuing this. Um, eventually, after extensive negotiations and discussions, um, we reached a resolution in which one person was dropped out of the case because it was moved to the Eastern District of, of Virginia, 
for political reasons, because the Department of Justice was not happy with what was going on in the Northern District of California. So they moved the case to Virginia, which traditionally has been used by the Department of Justice um, as the political enforcement mechanism for the administration. If you take a look over the years of where the cases involving whistleblowers, involving political activists, involving quote unquote terrorism, largely come out of it's the Eastern District in Virginia. The Northern District of California has a little different approach. We've spent a long time and a lot of energy and activity. We've disposed of the case, and at the end of the day, uh, you've got 13 persons that are going to, in essence, in December, walk out of the courtroom with misdemeanors, with $5,600 in restitution, for lack of a better word, and conditional discharges. Uh, meanwhile, the Eastern District of Virginia has geared up a, who, a, a next generation of cases going after essentially the same conduct, the same activity, some of the same individuals, but they're now in the Eastern District of Virginia, very much with Weave, who recently was reversed and released from prison after being sentenced to prison for a year because a case was cherry-picked and put in New Jersey and didn't belong there. The government gets to pick and choose what districts in this day and age they wish to bring federal prosecutions in because the day of crossing boundaries of states is gone. The government gets to say it's cyberspace. It's all over the country. It's all over the world. So that's why we can pick and choose where we want to prosecute someone. So where are we at today with the whole issue of criminalizing dissent? The government has made it very clear through this administration this is the most politicized Department of Justice in recent history. I never thought I'd be able to say I miss the Department of Justice under Richard Nixon. This is a Department of Justice that enforces the geopolitical agenda of Barack Obama. This is a Department of Justice that goes after whistleblowers selectively. This is a Department of Justice was recently caught eavesdropping in the defense camp of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's team in Guantanamo Bay. This is a Department of Justice where the Attorney General goes to Congress, tells them to screw off, gets held in contempt, and they laugh. This is a Department of Justice where the head of the IRS goes to Congress, admits that they have selectively been singling out individuals and movements for investigations and prosecutions based upon politics. Another example of how this particular Department of Justice, and I suspect the ones coming here and after, no matter how enlightened the next progressive president is going to be, it's been set. It's become an enforcement mechanism to serve and to enforce the political policies domestically and abroad of the President of the United States. Now, if you talk about criminalizing dissent, there's nothing more fundamentally dangerous than the Department of Justice, which historically has the prime responsibility, among others, of protecting dissent, of ensuring civil rights enforcement, of protecting First Amendment and Fourth Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment activities get the full faith that they're entitled to, has now put itself in the business with going after people who pose political opposition to this administration, whether it is quote unquote hackers, whether it is whistleblowers, whether it is journalists, whether it is lawyers, whether it is movements, whether it is activists, this Department of Justice and this administration sees them all as enemies and will do whatever it can to infiltrate, to disrupt, to prosecute, and to convict. And that's where we are at today with the whole school of discussion of the criminalization of dissent. Thank you very much. Greetings. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Hi. Uh, should I speak louder? Yeah. How's this? Is this good for everybody? Yes. Okay, excellent. 
Hi there. Um, my name is Scott Bybin. I am an artist and an inventor. And I go by the stage name Groucho Fractal. And then the name of my show is Groucho Fractal's Nearly Amazing Quantum Transdimensional Survival Guide at the End and Beginning of Everything which, as far as I know, is the only bicycle-powered stage show using brain-computer interface as a way of generating 3D vector graphics, which are then printed on a 3D printer using organic fair trade raw almond paste ground up by the audience members in a bike-powered blender, which then the audience eats, um, based in West Philadelphia. I think there are probably some other shows just like this elsewhere. Um, yeah. So. Uh, uh, I'm going to uh, show you a couple of things today. Uh, a couple of things are working, a couple of things are not working, but that's okay because we'll get through this and we'll get through this quickly. So one of the things that I really love to do with the Groucho Fractal Show is bring together unlikely ideas and combine them. It can be in technology, it can be in, uh, it can be in literature. It's basically this whole idea of creating systems in unlikely uh, ways. And um, so what I will show you guys first is um, piece number one. This is a bicycle. Yes, this is a normal, ordinary bicycle that you can pedal on. Uh, what makes it a kind of uh, unique is that we've taken the tire off of this and we've put a belt on here and attached this belt to this 24 volt DC motor, we made a 3D printed part that attach this, attaches this motor, uh, sorry, attaches uh, the belt to the motor via a pulley. Um, now the pulley itself came from an auto part. It was, a, it was an idler pulley from a, from a Ford engine. And what we did was we took it off and we took a grinder and ground out the lip that held a bearing in there. And, that's, and, uh, and then we were able to put a 3D printed part in here so that it can spin. Now, a motor is a generator as well if you spin the motor. And if you attach a, um, if you attach a diode to it um, so that it directs the current. So the concept behind this is that we take the bicycle and the bicycle when somebody, somebody, uh, when somebody is pedaling the bicycle, um, it generates electricity that comes over to this microgrid. This microgrid consists of a pack of supercapacitors. There are 10 2.7 volt supercapacitors uh, at 350 farads apiece, which means that the whole pack is 27 volts and 35 farads. And that's, uh, it's an amazing uh, taser right there, um, if somebody were to use it as such. Um, it's also uh, connected to a 12 volt deep cycle battery. Now, the reason why we're connecting these two is that with, with a battery, if you're just, uh, if you're using this to power your grid, the battery gradually kind of droops in terms of the amount of power that's coming out of it. So if you attach uh, capacitors to it, what it does is it keeps the levels high enough so that you don't have a drop off. It's a very, uh, very fun uh, thing that we came up with. And uh, yeah, and this is one of the open source concepts behind uh, what we do is basically we, uh, we being this kind of organization that I'm part of called Sufficiently Advanced Technologies. Um, we're basically just a group of geeks getting together and figuring out ideas which we can open source, which people can make use of in the world. So um, if you're planning on making a microgrid, this is a pretty good setup. And this is attached to a power inverter. Now we could go off of DC directly, but one of the reasons why, I'm sh why we're including an inverter is actually to show you how much loss there is when you're converting from DC to AC um, because we're also uh, going to need to convert from AC to DC. 
um, in order to get these devices to work. These devices being this laptop and this 3D printer and this projector. These are all operating off of this battery and supercapacitor combination. And uh, if you bicycle, it'll just generate enough electricity to kind of, kind of keep it going. Um, so if, um, if you're not familiar, uh, DC um, is a way of generating electricity. Well, DC is a uh, sorry direct current. Basically, it is when electricity travels over short distances. Um, alternating current is created by having a set of alternating. Sorry, I keep. I I, I wonder how how I'm doing. I, sorry, I'm rushing through this whole thing. Apologies, everyone. Okay. So direct current, um, direct current is uh, is when you have a is, sorry, direct current is created when you have a generator that has a positive and a ground uh, wire on a, wrapped around a core, and you have uh, a couple of magnets uh, uh, around it, and just like this uh, this motor, this is. An example of a DC motor. It's just a, it's just a, um, a copper wire wrapped around an iron core, with a positive and a ground uh, for magnets. Now, uh, if I was to create alternating current, what I would do is I would have, I would have two uh, wires wrapped around a core, and then four magnets. So I'd have two po uh, one positive, one ground, and then another positive and another ground. And the thing is, when you're creating alternating current, you can actually transport electricity over long distances. Now, that was one of the ideas that uh, Nikola Tesla had um, when he built the first hydroelectric uh, power plant at, um, at Niagara Falls um, in order to send electricity to New York City. Now, it is a great, it is a, alternating current is an absolutely great way of transporting electricity over long distances. But one of the things that's very problematic about it is that you can't store electricity in alternating current situations unless you're doing something like pumping water up to a reservoir and then having that water come back down through a hydroelectric dam. So it's very inefficient. So the, um, so currently the technology is such that we can have uh, solar powered systems and wind powered systems locally set up and we can have local power co-ops uh, so that we don't have to have power transported to us from long distances. Um, and uh, one of the problems with the way that, uh, that alternating current is set up currently is that uh, it's um, that the power grid that we have is largely supplied by coal plants. There's nothing inherently wrong with alternating current as a technology. In fact, it's a great way of uh, transporting electricity. But the problem is that the majority of the inputs are actually from coal and things like nuclear, um, which uh, are incredibly non-sustainable. So, um, so one of the things that I'm trying to teach with this show as I bring it to festivals is um, the difference between uh, direct current and alternating current and also showing people how to uh, power large groups of things. How am I doing on time? Five minutes, five minutes. Five, ten, okay, cool. So, okay, sorry I'm rushing through this. If you have any questions after, afterwards, I'll leave a, leave a couple of moments. Um, so, um, one of the reasons why we, I actually came up with the system was that I wanted to actually have a bicycle-powered 3D printer. So, this is the SourcerBot. This is a 3D printer that was created by the Sufficiently Advanced Technologies group. Um, it is not just a 3D printer. What this actually is, is, a, um, it is a, the product of an app. And so the idea is that we have this app where you can plug in various, uh, various things that you would like from a 3D printer. Let's say, hypothetically, you wanted a 3D printer that was 12 inches by 48 inches by 36 inches. You can plug in these coordinates. 
and let's say that you wanted a food printing head, and you wanted a uh, you wanted a plastruder, and you wanted a Dremel head, and you wanted all these things on one uh, on one three D printer. Well, what it will do is it will spit out the STL files for the three D printed parts, like these, the cut files, uh, for the DXF files which are uh, the things that uh, make up the box. All the dependencies for the hardware, which you need to cut, like the smooth rods and the, uh, the threaded rods, and all the programming for the Arduino, uh, which is right over here. This is a uh, microcontroller. And the, uh, yeah, and that is how uh, all these things are controlled. It's the interface between uh, this computer and this 3D printer that gives it uh, its instructions. So um, yeah, so we came up with this uh, fully open source, fully free, uh, free software, free hardware, uh, 3D printer that we're going to release the code for, hopefully by July, um, and release it out into the world under GPL. And uh, hopefully, you guys will want to make your own SourcerBot in time. Uh, so um, one of the things that I was not able to do was get some of the goo in here. This is uh, one of our creations. This is uh, the goo extruder. This is a paste extruding head that can fit onto the X carriage of the sorcerer bot. And what it does is it prints out um, paste and that type of thing. So I wonder if maybe I can show you uh, an example of it working. Okay, give me one second. that thing on. Dun, dun, dun. Sorry guys. Okay. okay. Let's see. And uh, the thing is I'm not proposing that everybody power their house with um, with bicycle power. I mean you can do it. It might be really interesting. And it definitely is not the most efficient use of, uh, of the food that you might eat. Um, but it definitely is fun. So here, let's take a look at a bike-powered 3D printer making some food. And then I'll take questions. Ah, here we go. Okay. So one of the things I'll say about uh, the Groucho Fractal Show, it's uh, it's an educational show. It's uh, designed to teach people about uh, open source technologies and it, and encouraging people. Here we go. Here we go. Let me move this to the side. Okay, so what you see right here is the food printing head uh, printing out some goo. And that is actually, uh, it's printing out some raw almond paste onto a couple of cookies. Um, and uh, if you come and see the Groucho Fractal show um, in its full iteration, uh, you will, uh, I guess you'll get a chance to use brain computer interface as a way of generating 3D objects, which can then be printed on the 3D printer. And uh, here, let me uh, show you what I use. Oh, it's somewhere around here. Ah, yes. So I'll leave you with this. Okay, this, um, 
for better or for worse, is the future of inter the way that we're going to interface with computers. Um, this is a NeuroSky device. It is a single sensor EEG device that allows you to, uh, allows you to uh, use neurofeedback as a way of, uh, I guess, controlling computers. Um, we are these kind of electrical, electrical generation plants. Uh, the electricity in our body goes to our brains and um, our brains process this information and you can see the changes in the way that your brain processes information. So um, if you're not looking for a ton of precision and you just want to measure changes and use those changes in order to trigger a computer to do something, let's say uh, a la using uh, MIDI as a way of controlling, uh, uh, having one device control another device, if you use the changes in the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic uh, waves uh, due to using concentration uh, or being touched or like if you want to use those uh, changes you can uh, do some pretty interesting things like making art. So okay, I have rushed through an entire thing in about 15 minutes and uh, I, you guys are probably as confused as I am. So okay, any Questions? Yes? So this is uh, more similar, like on, on a scale, to what they're doing in Germany with their local power generations, and you're showing this the possibilities, correct? Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, see, I'm all about local, uh, local power generation um, because I think that it is synonymous with autonomy. That um, if you are uh, if you are connected to the electrical grid um, that is owned by whatever corporations and controlled by whatever governments are, which are controlled by those corporations and vice versa, um, then uh, you're essentially, uh, I guess, beholden to, uh, yeah, you're essentially beholden to those corporations who have uh, the control of uh, the means of how you uh, consume or if you're even allowed to consume electricity uh, and you have very little say as to how it's actually generated. Whereas the technology has gotten to the point now that we can have local power generation because solar is, uh, is at the sweet spot, it's affordable now, wind power is affordable, battery technology is becoming excellent, uh, uh, capacitor technology is, 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 a, is uh, it's becoming more and more amazing exponentially every day. So it's a really good time to actually start thinking about autonomous uh, means of generating electricity and having small neighborhood uh, electricity generation co-ops. So that, that's one of the thought processes behind that. Like Sandy, I mean, it became very evident how dependently on power and how yeah. Yeah. important it would be in a disaster. Or right, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, like the, I guess, um, you know, comparing the electrical grid to um, to the monopoly that uh, the monopoly that uh, telecommunications companies have over electricity. When you, oh, sorry, over, uh, sorry, over the internet. Uh, when you have a um, when you have a series of flatulent monopolies, um, kind of controlling, you know, controlling the means of, sorry. I needed to say it. <laughs> Sorry. When, when you have these companies that are just kind of like stale and attempting to grab more power, what are you going to have? You're going to have incredible inefficiency. You're going to have uh, c complete failures um, because of uh, hubris, because of stupidity. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I, th I think uh, just like the failures that sometimes happen in the power grid, and sometimes these deliberate failures, um, like we had, like we had with uh, with en uh, with Enron years ago. Um, uh, if we have um, large uh, monopolistic systems where you have a couple of people at the helm who are either stupid or greedy, you're going to have massive failures. And so, you know, for example, with uh, net neutrality, one of the, you know, if net neutrality is gutted and the uh, and corporations like Comcast or Time Warner are given um, are given 
control over the means by which people communicate, uh, we will not only be spending the two hours that it normally takes on, with customer service in order to get our internet restored, um, we will be spending many more hours with customer service who know absolutely nothing um, in order to make sure that our websites aren't loading at 28K. Practically speaking, the number is 50%. Centralized anything generally is 50% less efficient. Yes. And in power, we're losing 50% from the centralized point all the way to the household. So that's why you're pro, um, that's why you're pro, uh, op you're pro uh, open systems. I'm pro localized Excellent. Yes. Very good. Any other uh, comments, questions before uh, we move on to the next? Uh, yes. Um, are you still sort of in beta mode? Is there a community that takes you on, so to speak, where you kind of have something that you want to see? Yeah. Um, it's con the concept behind the show is to be constantly in beta and alpha mode. Um, constantly adding new uh, technologies to the show, new prototypes, um, and then open sourcing these prototypes and giving people uh, the chance to kind of take these ideas and run with them. So I do shows at, um, at festivals, at schools, at hacker spaces, and uh, different places where people would have me. Uh, you know, also just kind of random hit and run shows. Um, because the thing is the show can be done completely off grid. I could potentially do this on a street corner and then just introduce people to some of these concepts. Do you have a team of people or is it just you? Uh, I'm, I actually have some of the people in our team right here. This is uh, Elizabeth Jane Cole and Brian Cohen um, and Chicken, the dog, is right here. Chicken is actually uh, the person who dictates everything. Um, yes, yes. Um, when it is time to take a walk, that is the time to take a walk. Um, yeah, so uh, this is part of the team. Uh, there's actually a whole huge team of people that are developing stuff within these projects. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, we're just a bunch of geeks that really like open source technologies and putting it out into the world in an artful and fun way. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And everyone, big thanks to Ted Shulman for uh, for for pulling this whole for pulling this together, like bringing bringing uh, I guess a whole bunch of people together, and and uh, yeah, and uh, this is the catalyst for for this uh, this whole gathering. This the gathering was a bunch of people pulled together who pulled this thing together at the last minute, ad hoc, got the room, made advertisements, uh, spread the word. And uh, yeah, and it, it is, uh, I guess, a testament to the power of uh, collaboration and, I guess, uh, um, ad-libbing when, uh, when it's chance. So here, everyone, I, give, I, yeah. Why don't I just take one second, because uh, thank you. And um, we had planned to introduce Reclaim as, as part of this presentation. We're running out of time, and we're not going to be really going into Reclaim and what Reclaim is. Well, why don't you talk about it right now? Um, and I'm going to talk about it right now very quickly. Um, this is the soft launch of Reclaim. Reclaim grew out of Occupy. Um, a number of people here um, um, were involved with um, Occupy Tech Ops, Occupy Open Source, and Occupy Earth Summit. Um, and, um, and through those um, groups, um, at the Earth Summit, um, we were involved with the United Nations Rio Plus 20 um, conference, which was held in June of 2012. Um, this was a global conference. It was the 20th anniversary of the first Earth Summit, and we occupied it. Um, New York um, OWS sent representatives down to Rio. Um, Queen Mother Doris Blakely, who is the community mayor of Harlem, presented the United Nations with the open source imperative. So Re Reclaim and a lot of what Reclaim is about has grown out of the open source imperative. Um, that was Do Occupy's document for sustainability, that if we're going to have a sustainable future, it has to be open sourced. If we're going to have an equitable future, it has to be open sourced. And it was an initial guiding document on how open source can be globally transformative. 
In the two years since Occupy, our group has continued to work together to try to bring together a lot of the voices and, and the key opinion makers and concepts that grew out of the movement. Um, Reclaim is, uh, is our attempt at bringing that together. And um, the formal launch of Reclaim is going to be this summer, um, the beginning of August, in alignment with um, the two row wampum um, um, festival. Um, two row wampum, um, and actually the, the timing is perfect now. Um, Ted Hall, um, who is helping to co produce that. Um, if, if you come up and, and join me, and we only have two minutes because we're behind schedule, and this is, this is Reclaim in two minutes. Right. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, so I, I just backgrounded. We're up to right now. This is our soft launch. And just tell us very quickly about two row, and then, and then we hand it over and, and we Great. get on with the show. Yeah, the, uh, so can you guys hear me? That's sort of live cast. All right, well, this is for the live cast, yeah. sorry. So this uh, two row is the oldest treaty in this region. It's the reason why you and I are here. Uh, it, it would just be Algonquins, Haudenosaunee, Onondaga, the Six Nations, the Lenape. But because we had this treaty that was extended 401 years ago, we can be here. And also the United States was founded and the interaction with the Onondaga leadership and uh, our founding fathers of this country, which is uh, you know critical to self-determined governance and for all these amazing technologies we depend on and uh, we wouldn't be here without that union and uh, that we're continuing this anniversarial uh, rowing from last year that happened between uh, Troy New York and New York City or Albany in New York and we're going to do it again um, to share these cross-cultural technologies of survival with Onondaga and Six Nations youth and our friends here and to continue the education opportunities of multicultural collaboration that we need at this moment of a, this mass extinction event that we're witnessing in human history. So uh, the respect between different cultures and sovereign nations, the Haudenosaunee are sovereign nations, uh, is a sovereign confederacy that has its own passports and uh, for our country to advance and for any country to advance it requires a mutual respect of our sovereignty and uh, these are our neighbors so this is one of the good ways that we can make sure our water is clean our air is clean and that our communication systems are just so it, for a just network it's very important to keep relations between different <coughs> nations and cultures uh, fair and uh, awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, so that's, the, that's the official launch this summer. Um, and um, that's going to lead up to involvement again with the United Nations. Next March is going to be an event at the UN called Beijing Plus 20. And just like we were involved with Rio plus 20, the 20th anniversary of the Earth Summit. Um, next year is going to be the 20th anniversary of the first international women's conference at the UN. We're participating with um, an organization called Man Up Campaign. Man Up is a global culture change campaign focused around awareness on gender-based violence issues. And our intent is to work with Man Up, with the Internet Society, and to once again bring the open source imperative um, with the Internet Society, um, the, um, the new Magna Carta, guaranteeing global Internet rights for everyone, and, and, and other broader transformative um, programs that are being developed around Reclaim. Um, so, um, so we're really just kicking off, and right now we have a year's worth of events that we're planning to build up to it. And, um, and I guess that we need to pick up with our next speaker, or we're going to run out of time. One quick uh, announcement. One, one, uh, no, we're going to have a quick announcement first. <laughs> very, very quick. Blindingly fast. Okay, yes. This is uh, breaking news, I guess. Uh, the Internet Society uh, is going to sponsor a Internet Governance Forum on July 16th. 
Uh, okay. The mic. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. The internet, the internet Society, the global organization, uh, is going to sponsor an internet governance forum on July 16th in Washington, D.C. The exact uh, uh, location has not been picked yet, but they are looking to do a, uh, have a satellite uh, event here in New York City as well. So. So, Paul Garrett. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, thank, who are you, Paul? Hi. Uh, I, first of all, I want to thank the organizers of this and the Internet Society for uh, inviting me and actually Nicole Brideson, my friend, who's a journalist, founder of Brooklyn the Borough, hyper-local, uh, worker-owned, uh, user-generated media platform, independent. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Garrett. Some of you know me. Uh, many of you may have heard about me, and a lot of you probably have no idea who I am. So um, I, I come to this forum because um, what we're looking at right now, there's a burning question is, is what is this notion of democracy in the digital realm? And so I want to ask you all a question. How many believe there is such a thing? Raise your hand. Everybody, everybody who believes there is such a thing as a free speech democracy in cyberspace. You, you, is this a consensus? Everybody believes that? Okay. Let me ask another question. When you're shopping in Kmart, what are your constitutional rights? Anybody want to? Anybody want to volunteer that? No, no. What? No, specific, I'm serious. This is not a joke. What are your constitutional rights when you shop in Kmart? They are restricted. Question is, let me ask a little bit more specifically. Do you have any? Funny speech? No, you're, you're restricted because you're on a private property. This guy knows. Okay, the answer is no. When you're shopping in Kmart, when you're in Starbucks, when you're in the mall, there are no constitutional protections. Welcome to the internet. The internet is Kmart. When you're on the internet, you do not have constitutional rights. What you have is a contract, right? Well, what happens when you sign up? You know, you go to the thing with the F, the thing with the T, the thing with the G, A, right? I don't even need to say their names. I'm not going to advertise for them because you're already indoctrinated. But what happens when you go there and you sign up? What do you do? Anybody? Yes. No, and nobody reads them. Doesn't matter because, well, actually, it does matter, and people should read it because what you're doing there is you're not agreeing to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. What you're doing is, is actually you're waiving your rights. You're waiving your rights. Point taken. So, uh, to start off with a thesis that democracy in cyberspace is something that we need to draft, author, create, agree to, is really a fool's errand. And why is that? Well, I don't want to sound like Bill Clinton when he ran, uh, when he said it's the economy, stupid. But I'm going to say it. I don't like to call anybody stupid, so forgive me. It's the oligarchy, stupid. It's the oligarchy. Going to the FCC, we'll talk about many things, but that's, our, that's the premise. So first of all, there is no democracy in cyberspace. You're at Kmart. You're at Starbucks. It's the same in the digital realm. When, when Stanley Cohen talked about the PayPal 14 and what happened was, uh, for people who don't understand that, just very quickly, uh, you know, WikiLeaks released uh, Manning's documents, and it was very damaging. And WikiLeaks, uh, everybody thinks, oh, that's journalism. That's the fourth estate. That's a First Amendment protection. These guys have every uh, right, and we should empower them to be the watchdogs, to be the whistleblowers, to, to uh, convey this information. What happened? Where did they host? They were hosted on Amazon Cloud. What happened with PayPal? PayPal. 
WikiLeaks didn't violate their, they didn't even violate their contract. It was by a whim. It was a political move that PayPal stopped processing those transactions. And what did Amazon Cloud do? They shut them down. So you don't have any freedom of speech. You don't have any First Amendment. Everybody says, oh, free speech, First Amendment. And you don't have it in cyberspace. What you have is like, uh, you know, if at best you're living in a rent-controlled apartment where your landlord wants to kick you out or raise your rent. And you don't have any of that. So when Amazon shut down WikiLeaks, they didn't violate their contract either. Did, were they paying their bill? Of course they were paying their bill but they were doing something unpopular. Something unpopular that did what? Challenge the power structure. And now, and so, and what happened with these uh, anonymous folks? What did they do? They were charged, in a sense, with a type of attack on the critical infrastructure. That's, that can be called cyber war, that could be called terrorism. These people were charged, as Stanley said, with very, very serious charges. Stanley was very humble because what he really managed to do was to change the perception of the prosecution that the PayPal 14 incident was not terrorism. This was free speech. They were exercising their free speech by doing a sit-in because a DOS or a denial of service or distributed denial of service attack in that realm of hacktivism, of this collective action in protest against this de facto censorship, if you will, was akin to blocking an intersection. That it was like sitting at the lunch counter. It was uh, another way of protest, and that's a First Amendment right. So this wasn't cyber terrorism at all. What kind of damage does a DDoS do? It doesn't do any damage to the systems. They didn't extract any data. All they did was they blocked people from doing transactions with PayPal. Why? Because PayPal unfairly discontinued service to somebody who wasn't even breaking their agreement. Why? Political reasons. So what it comes down to is who owns the internet? That's another question I like to, I like to ask people is uh, where's the internet and who owns it? And as we can see, uh, it's owned by a small few of the, the less than 1%. And what's happening is and I don't know if anybody uh, watches PBS. Did anybody watch the Frontline series that's on lately now? Okay. And last night was especially revealing. And, and uh, for me, honestly, listening to what happened, what Snowden revealed to me is a vindication. Because I've been saying this for 20 years. For me, in 1994, WWW meant worldwide wiretap. And the surveillance isn't anything new. They were already changing the telecommunications laws requiring equipment manufacturers for phone switches in the 90s. This is what really, before even internet. I wasn't introduced to the internet until 1992, 93, uh, the UNESCO fellow in Germany. And uh, I was already reading it that the telecom switches had to have wiretap capabilities built in. And guess who paid for it? Rate hikes. So the subscribers paid. So this is nothing new. The, the, the uh, man from AT&T, when he spotted the, the splitters in the fiber optics and how the NSA was tapping it, there's nothing new. It's just more advanced. And you're all in it. And everyone who feeds into this system, there's no way out. So you can write all the documents you want, but it's wishful thinking unless you can change that contract. Unless, unless we empower ourselves to build, create an economic and sustainable case to build, own, and operate our own infrastructure. And if I were to say that if we were to do anything, because I don't think we need to rewrite any kind of rights, documents, whatever, all respect to those who want to do a cyber Magna Carta, because we have a fantastic document called the United States Constitution. Yeah. But where is that in cyberspace? It doesn't exist. So how do we reclaim it? You want to talk about reclaim? I think that's a very important thing to do, but we have to know what to reclaim and how. How do we do it? Well, first of all, let's talk about net neutrality. How many people remember in 2009 the FCC's position on net neutrality? Does anybody remember that? We have any memory in this room? What, what was it? 
they were trying to keep it, uh, they were trying to uh, preserve uh, uh, uniform access. Okay, so effectively in 2009, the FCC said the opposite of what they're uh, apparently being perceived to say today, which is we're all for it, right? We're all for net neutrality. What happened? But what else was the decision? The, dec the other thing that was very important in the decision, and I want to point to this today, because there are places where we need to focus our resources and places where we don't need to focus our resources. And I say very uh, uh, seriously, beware the thought misleaders. What Stanley talked about COINTELPRO, COINTELPRO is a way to infiltrate your mind to make you do the wrong thing so you don't do the right thing. And, and so the FCC, didn't have the authority one way or the other with respect to net neutrality. Why? They don't regulate the internet. They don't, they don't regulate the charge for data tariffs online. They don't regulate anything. What they regulate is the physical lines, the rights of way, and the broadcast spectrum. And they have nothing to do with net neutrality. So today coming out about net neutrality and yelling at the FCC is meaningless, and it's a waste of effort. Yes? But they, they haven't exercised that, and, and whatever they said about the net neutrality, it, it already exists in uh, the business commercial practice for the, the uh, companies as it is now. And the fact that they own the rights of, that they own the medium, it, they can control it. And that's really what it comes down to. So what I'm saying is, is it's really about, not about regulation, it's about the oligarchy. It's about the small concentration of power that owns, operates the infrastructure and uh, how to control it. So what we as, and, and finally, just to make it clear that net neutrality is what's called a last mile issue. So last mile is the connection between the ISP, the upstream, and the, the, and the members. Um, so how to, how to deal with this is some of the things, now I missed the dark fiber lecture earlier, but uh, some of the things that we need to do and, and I guess, actually, if I were to say that we were to update or clarify the First Amendment, it's not only about the freedom of the press. The First Amendment in the digital age is about the rights of citizens to build, own, and operate their own networks and to interconnect. Oh. The comments. And net neutrality is critical to that, but the way we achieve that isn't by just feeding the beast, but it's really by reclaiming our rights as citizens to build, own, and operate our networks and to fight the oligarchies. Now, you know, it's been said that the internet functions because of two things, rough consensus and running code, right? Everybody heard that before? Rough consensus and running code. Well, there's a lot of spirit and emotion and everything about how we as citizens uh, should be treated in cyberspace, uh, but really what it comes down to is running code beats running mouths. So you can talk all you want, but if you don't act, if you don't actually build, if you don't actually create things and, and, and something that's sustainable, not a temporary autonomous zone, a permanent presence, a permanent community, then we're never going to achieve this. So what we need to do is, uh, I'm a pragmatist. For the last you know, 20 years, 18 years, I've been working on how to get this done. Now I started in the 90s with a project called Name.Space. And what happened was 1995 was a turning point on the internet because that's when it was allowed to do commerce. That was the EFF's first mission, was actually to allow commerce on the internet, change the acceptable use policy. Also at that time was when the domain name started to be charged $100 for registration when prior to that it was free. So most people, being reactionary, said, we think it should still be free. We don't want to pay a fee. My question was, how does it work? And when I explored, thankfully, what is open about the internet, what is the commons, what is our, our right, is the open source code. Because the protocols of the internet are public, and then that we can take that and create something from that. So what I did while other people were building web servers, I was building domain name servers. And I was creating top level domains. And so in 1996, name.space was the first to actually crowdsource, create, run the infrastructure, build the registry software, 
create a who is, create URL forwarding, create zone editing. In 1996, we created .nyc, we created .art, we created .film, and, and with the wisdom of the crowd, 500 and some other top level domains. And we had these running in six countries. We had the domain re uh, uh, database replicated in six countries. We had the first real time registry and all these other things that we innovated, but we had one barrier something called the root. Because when we first started the project, we didn't realize, everybody believed that the internet was a decentralized medium. That you plug in and then it works. It wasn't the case because there was a monopoly that controlled the central database of the domain name system called the root. And, and if you're not recognized in the root zone, your domains don't work on the rest of the internet. And so people say, well, why are the domain names important? Well, when I read about how Turkish government censors the internet, how people couldn't get on Twitter in Turkey or in Egypt during the Arab Spring is because they took over the domains. When people protested about SOPA, Stop Online Piracy, and PIPA, it was about domain seizures and taking down the domains. How do people in Turkey get around to Twitter? Well, what they did was they used open domain name servers and they switched their control panel. Guess what? That's how name.space had to do it in the 90s. So what we did then, people, there was a handful of people who were early adopters who did that. Most people, it's still today too technically difficult. But what we did <clears throat> was we asked the monopoly include our data. So we approached Network Solutions, now VeriSign, please add our data to the root so our domains work, like .com. And they denied that they had a responsibility, but of course they did. They were the ones who managed and changed the data in the root zone. So uh, my uh, partners and I, we had no choice except to file an antitrust lawsuit. And so we used the lawsuit that MCI used to break up AT&T against Network Solutions, and guess what? It stuck. They couldn't dispose it because we were right. And what happened with MCI versus AT&T? It broke up the phone company monopoly in the United States. With Name.Space versus Network Solutions, well, probably because the parent company of Network Solutions uh, at that time was SAIC, or Science Applications International Corporation. Their board of directors includes people like Robert Gates, who was just the Secretary of Defense, but before, before that was head of the CIA. Uh, Bobby Inman, who was the head of the National Security Agency. This was run by the spooks. So in the end, what happened was we didn't win the lawsuit because, why? Not because Network Solutions didn't break the antitrust law, it was because they got immunity. Just like the illegal wiretapping with AT&T under the Patriot, before the Patriot, they got immunity. And then in the meantime, the ICANN was formed, the Internet Corporation for Sign Names and Numbers. I was part, I was part of that so-called multi-stakeholder process. It was a betrayal. This multi-stakeholderism is the oligarchy. And that's what our lawsuit is about now. We're suing ICANN now because they just raised the stakes for the top level domains that only the 1% can afford. And it's run by the oligarchy and it's a bunch of insiders and we name names in our lawsuit and we're trying to reclaim what's ours. Um, so in the end, the only way that we're able to reclaim this or to build any kind of a democracy in cyberspace is to actually construct it. And so first thing we have to do is I ask you inform yourselves. I will be glad to share information. Name.space versus ICANN. We're now before the Ninth Circuit in California. Uh, basically, ba what ICANN has done is they've absconded with top-level domains, including .nyc, that we created, and they're handing them over to the, to the oligarchy, including Newstar, who's a, a former division of Lockheed Martin, and they just bought one of the largest uh, data mining companies in, in America that's undermining all your personal information and liberties. So supporting, supporting that, supporting ICANN, Google and Amazon, they're the biggest predators of our domains. If you look at, they couldn't even file to ICANN under their own names. Amazon's called donuts, like coffee and donuts, like they're the pigs, you know? And, and, uh, and Google went under some other name, I can't remember the, what is it? Charleston Road, thank you, sir. Uh, they couldn't even go under their own name. And then now we'll look at this consolidation because what this is is it's a vertical integration that harms the public interest. Why, and Amazon as well. Why should Amazon, who shut down WikiLeaks, have .book? Well, fuck all you independent uh, book people if you're not on Amazon. You'll never get your domain, and then if they want to cut down whether your access to your website is working or not, well, guess what? Or if you don't pay your fee in time, they take it. And same with Google. 
the domain, I mean, in the early days before uh, PRISM and everything else, it got so all the data fusion and then the waving of the rights and the, and the concentration of all your personal information on Facebook and everything. Before that even happened, Echelon was there. They used to use the domains because that's your metadata. Every time you click a link, every time you send an email, it does a source and destination. That's your metadata. Yeah? What do you think of name points? We've got to get on schedule. I'm sorry. Uh, I know we originally had an hour, but um, I'm sorry. Name coin, you know, I, I think it's unfortunate what's going on in that whole realm. Um, but name coin, the interesting thing about it, I don't understand the monetary part of it fully, but that their notion of a decentralized DNS is what the name.space model was. Oh, yeah. When we advocated the shared registry, which, by the way, our lawsuit did lower domain registration fees and caused the wholesale resale market. So the fact that there is a GoDaddy or these other companies in business that resell domains is because we sued and broke the monopoly. I'm still broke. Didn't help me. Uh, but we have a more social enterprise model that involves our public commons and the public infrastructure that would give them a source of revenue. And so it's vital that not only we win the antitrust lawsuit against ICANN, but that people also realize that there are a lot of other things that we can do. I know that we're out of time. Um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I did want to get into some of the effort that I'm working to, to create a um, alternative last mile with the Wi-Fi and Y uh, broadband network, but I'll be glad to communicate with any of you offline. If you want to have my contact, uh, p please feel free. And uh, thanks again for your attention. And sorry, I wanted to do more Q&A and stuff like that, but you know, I, I don't want to take everybody's time. I know that there's a lot more going on, and I really appreciate uh, your thoughtful attention. Thank you. last name? Uh, Lowenhaupt. Hi, and now to continue with the top level domain is, is top lo Tom Lowenhaupt, um, and um, he's going to talk about dot NYC. Um, our objective is, um, is to um, bring Robert um, to the podium at 8 o'clock, and um, Robert will speak for a half hour or so. Following that, we can then have more open discussion with everybody and questions and answers, and and definitely want to continue with the top-level domain concepts. So let me turn it over. Yeah, I'm Tom Lohenhelp, and I think Paul's going to be around later on as well, be part of a, a panel of some sort, is what I heard. But uh, I'm involved with, um, uh, I've been involved with uh, .NYC for a, uh, uh, a, a decade or so. And do uh, you think F5 does it? Yeah, uh, this is not Windows. Oh, OK. All right, sorry. And um, so I've been trying to figure out um, uh, which one is uh, how this thing could be used. And we've always uh, advocated as a public interest resource. I'll try and skip the, uh, the long story as to how it got here and focus on one narrow part of uh, what .myc can be. There was an article recently uh, this past Monday in the Gotham Gazette that went into uh, half a dozen or so different areas where uh, uh, the, the uh, TLD's pre presentation and ownership and such can be changed considerably to uh, the public's advantage. And um, I was uh, in this uh, somewhat visible uh, presentation here. I was trying to make the, the story about how, it's, uh, how this TLD, how .NYC is going to be governed, uh, how it can be done to, our, to, our, to the public's interest more. So um, but the story goes that when uh, they were building Central Park, or when they, well, they weren't building Central Park, when they were thinking about Manhattan and how to lay out the streets in 1811, they set up from 1st Street to 236th Street, from 1st Avenue to 11th Avenue, and they set up this terrific grid that was going to provide streets and allow you to uh, develop Manhattan in a, in a very efficient way. That worked very well. Uh, one of the things they forgot, and this is 1811, was to put in any parks because public parks didn't exist at the time. And there were no parks in the world, amazingly. And uh, there were some spaces in Great Britain that the king would own and people would go in on occasion to look at them. But in, in this country, we didn't have any parks. So 1840 comes along and people start thinking that we need parks in the city. What are we going to do? And they came up with the idea of Central Park. Uh, there were about 254 people living there at the time, and uh, they evicted them. Uh, Seneca Village is what it was called. And in, uh, this was a, uh, I think there were freed slaves that were living there. And they kicked them out and put in Central Park, 
very nice place. But the idea was that they didn't have an idea of public spaces, that type of public space at the time. Uh, and at this point, we don't have, within .NYC, there is no public space. You know, there will not be, as it's planned, any public spaces. You know, everybody will be able to go out and buy domain names, uh, your, your Amazons and AOLs and whatever equivalents, but there won't be any public spaces. They'll all be owned by somebody. So we need some public spaces. You know, where we need to create public spaces uh, within .NYC. Uh, and what might these be? You know, uh, obviously in 1811, nobody knew about parks. And today we don't really know what our internet's going to be like 25 years from now. But we do need public spaces, you know. So the ones that I had proposed, okay, does this thing work? Good, good space, uh, space. That space bar. All right, good, good, good. Let me, let me get back there. Uh, so uh, uh, what, what this thing uh, does is, uh, um, let's see. Uh, Right, right. So this is where we got. We in Central Park, they kicked everybody out. And now we have uh, Seneca Village, right? Uh, the question is, where are the public spaces in the digital world, right? So I had some thoughts on what some of them could be, easy ones, you know? Forums.nyc, issues.nyc, fixed.nyc, change, voters, candidates.nyc. These are logical places for public dialogue to take place. Uh, I, you know. It only took a little while to put these together. There are far better ones. But we have to get a list together of what these names are, what the public spaces are. And then we have a second step is we have to find out how we can get the servers and such to make these things work, how we can get the, uh, uh, the tech people, the oversight and structures to make sure that they are free spaces in the sense of uh, we have an access, that we have access to them. Who's going to assure that we do this? As it stands now, the city of New York will be in charge of this. And I can in the city of New York. We're not running our own, as a people, we're not running our own uh, TLD. And, and uh, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, one of the things that we need also is we need money to run these things, to get the servers and the tech people to do it. And the way I propose to do that is to charge a dollar a name per year per domain name to be used to run our public spaces, our digital public spaces. If I have time for a question, I, I know I have well, at least one. Yes? Hi. Uh, will aggregate knowledge be serving the ads on all of your domain names? I'm sorry, say that again? Aggregate knowledge, the company that New Star bought, which by the way is a military contract. I have no idea. I don't know. I don't work for I don't work for New Star. I don't work for New Star. I don't work for the city of New York, all right? I'm working for, uh, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not, neither of them. I work for myself. I have no financial interest in .NYC whatsoever. Okay. Uh, you know the I never heard of them. I never heard of them. Never heard of them. No, no, no. But then you should probably do your homework. I don't know what you Well, I'm talking about these public spaces. That's the issue for today. How do we create public spaces within .NYC? Because it's going to be there whether New Star does it or whether the city of New York does They have to create these spaces. That's my message. Thank you. Uh, for any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Tom, that was great. I look forward to reading that brief more carefully. Yeah, and also, so I am on the mayor's advisory committee, unpaid for .NYC. And if there's a message as to how we make this work, I will be happy to bring it before the mayor. And perhaps we can pressure him to create these public spaces. Or you can write, write them directly, even better. You know, write him a note, go on the website, find the mayor, and say, listen, we need public spaces on .NYC. Where are they? How are you going to create them? Robert. I think, I think we also thought about the software on the platform, open source platform, that would allow. Oh, wait, right. so, oh, we're good. Mm -hmm. Just do this. Just have to fit in for me. Whoever was mentioned about the code rule that we need to have some sort of open source software that would allow for the transfer of the pen. Right. I, I, I'm going to try and repeat a little bit what Robert said because he doesn't have a mic, and uh, I know we're, we're not properly mic'd here tonight. And Robert was just saying that we should that we need to uh, uh, have an open source platform and, and training and uh, access to make sure that everybody uh, can can use these public spaces uh, when we create them. 
So um, with that, I'll uh, dance until the next speaker comes. Oh, you see, uh, there's another question we can just... I'm sorry, there's another question? Uh, yes. Uh, How do we fill this? There's not another question, so. You have to turn it. There's a question. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't look. In terms of uh, your, the way you're envisioning public space, how would, um, I mean, you, you had quite a few that you just threw up there, candidates and, and all of these different ideas, so they seem to be directed towards uh, public discussion. Um, what about truly free creative space, places where people are now driven, um, unfortunately, uh, to social media or to other um, contracts that um, don't benefit them? Um, have, have you had any opportunity to develop that, that type of I, idea? I, I would love to hear some, you know, I mean, basically, you know, all .NYC has are these names. And maybe, you know, if we can get creative, have a, a funding source. But, uh, you know, in terms of what these names are, it's, you know, there is no movement. There is no movement, as far as I know, within uh, City Hall to have public spaces at this point. I would like there to be uh, a movement to have public or common spaces uh, within .NYC. And, you know, these are the only people in New York, or, or there's a good group of people in New York to, to focus on that topic and try and make it a reality. So if you have any thoughts, let me know. So people, I don't know if everybody saw de Blasio's speech at the Internet Week, but one of the things that I thought was the most encouraging thing was his embracing of the disruptive dynamic of information technology. And so I think that really is an invitation to us to say how can these ideas that are not in the thing, how can that be brought in in a disruptive way? And part of it is in opening up the process so that the so there is, there's never been any, other than the, the new advisory board, which is somewhat functioning, there's really not been any effort for broad-based input into what this should be and what it can mean. Thank, thank you. That was uh, Robert Pollard, and here's David Solomonov. Okay. All right, uh, so we're going to uh, press for time, unfortunately, and so we're going to move to the next presentation, which is uh, Reactor, which is a game to facilitate social activism and uh, with uh, Josephine Dorado and Jeremy Pesner, and I have to confess to being a co-conspirator in this project. So, okay. Right. So, hi, my name is Josephine Dorado. And I'm Jeremy Pesner. And we'll be presenting a few points about Reactor, a mobile news game, a mo where mobile news meets mobile gaming. So we just want to talk a little bit about online activism first. There are a lot of really great online activist efforts in the past few years, like the Japan Earthquake Relief Fund, the Actions Against SOPA, Philippines Relief, Hurricane Sandy, etc. So just to focus in on one, I'll talk about the Japanese Earthquake Relief Fund, which was very, very much aided by Zynga, the makers of Farmville. So 24 hours after the Japanese earthquake, Zynga, the makers of Farmville, created a daikon, a little plant that you could plant in your Farmville, and then 100% of those proceeds went to the Earthquake Emergency Fund, and in five days, one and a half million dollars was raised. So that's kind of an amazing resource. And all of these initiatives were only possible within the time frame and scale because of the internet. As great as all these different social activism initiatives are, they suffer from a fragmentation issue. People are working on different causes, on different platforms, with different people involved. And therefore, for someone else who's just starting out and wants to figure out what to do, it's not really clear. In the case of that green sign there, you can see five different Twitter hashtags that were in use during the Philippines relief effort. The moral of this story is that there is currently no underlying service or structure that really represents the future of online activism as a total movement. So basically what we're pro proposing is that Reactor will close this gap. And it will be a mobile game that encourages activism around news stories that people care about. So in the moment that you read a piece of news and you get inspired to help, it will be matched to an action that you can do about that news item. You'll be able to see what's going on around you and see what you can do about it. So in these mock-ups, you'll see the red pins on the left are the news items around you, and the green pins on the right are the actions that you can take on those news items. 
So let's just take a case study example of a net neutrality news item. Everybody's favorite topic. Yes. <laughs> so the news item here, it's from the New York Times. It says that lobbying efforts um, lobbying efforts intensify after the FCC tries with the third time after Still neutrality. Okay. And on the right hand side are the actions matched with that. So one of them is bring a digital rights campaign to your hometown. Another is learn about the princip principles of net neutrality. Another is meet with your member of Congress. So these are all actions that you can take to the news. So it, basically it's linking news to actions. But it's doing it within a game framework. So for example, here in this mock-up, you'll see that the user Peggy has challenged me to a reactor match. She called the FCC chairman, Tom Wheeler, and to demand net neutrality and gain 20 points plus an ambassador badge. So you're going to get points for acting on the news, and then you can challenge friends to join you. So when you, com when you combine the news item plus the inspiration to act and activism within a game framework, you get reactor. Let's talk about the growth of mobile news and mobile gaming over the past few years. Even just a few years ago, people didn't have mobile. The idea of mobile news was not near, nearly so developed. Now, many people have an iPhone or another mobile device, and they almost always use it to go online and read some type of news. The news platforms themselves have also shifted to fit this mobile ecosystem, which has resulted in people reading a lot more news than they did before. On the mobile gaming front, it's the single most popular type of app in any type of app store. And actually, in September 2013, totaled half of all app downloads in total. The message we can take away from this is that gaming is king in the mobile ecosystem and gets a lot of positive attention. So to give you a little background about what the foundation was before this, I and some colleagues got a MacArthur Foundation Award in 2008 to create Fracture, which at the time was a website that aggregated news and matched it up with at social actions. So if it sounds familiar, it was very much the inspiration for it. But at the time, and we built an, a prototype around it, it's on SourceForge, but at the time we didn't have the infrastructure to make it, port it into a mobile and a game framework. But now very much is the time because the times have changed and now over half of the population owns a smartphone, and one in five globally, and one in 17 owns a tablet. But I think one of the most interesting things about all of this is that the most read item in the New York Times in 2013 was not an article. It was a quiz, the dialect quiz, if some of you remember this. So this is one of the questions from the dialect quiz. But basically, it became that popular, the most popular item, within three days of publishing. So one of the streams of revenue that we're looking at is news outlets and very much looking at how news can, how combining action and news within a game framework can increase their reach. New York Times spent $70 million in advertising last year and the BBC spent over 68.7 million pounds in advertising. So this is really about amplifying news reach but in such a way that it becomes augmented activism and advocacy. This might sound a little counterintuitive, but the group we're hoping to reach are not actually not activists. The, we don't really want to preach to the choir. Activists are doing great work already. We want to help make new activists out of the people who are news junkies and love playing games. That said, we of course understand that this platform provides an enormous opportunity for activism groups to really get their message out there in a new way. Ultimately, what we're looking for is a new sort of way for both news and activism producers to get their to, to tie their material together in a unique and interesting way that will appeal to today's digital consumer. So all this would be pie in the sky except for the fact that we have already done a project lifecycle as a website and we have an amazing team on board this time. So Jeremy and I and also David Solomonoff, the president of the Internet Society here, and an advisory team that contains representatives from the BBC, Samantha Bar Barry, the social media producer of BBC, Adam Ellick from New York Times, Phil Lyon from Al Jazeera, so we have um, major media outlets covered as well as the Online News Association, and lots of networking. Over half of our team are Fulbright, so we have a really great tie to the Fulbright Association and the Internet Society as well. And one more thing we'll point out is that if you want to find out more and um, be on our beta testing list and just um, you know, find out when it actually comes out, is go to reactorgame.com, reactor-game.com, and there's a link to our mailing list as well as to this Prezi presentation. So thank you for listening, and we'll take questions. You're just applauding because we did it in a short amount of time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
wish everybody were that good. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'd love to hear from you. What are some of your thoughts and questions? Yes? Um, I have three quick questions which should have quick answers. Mm -hmm. Who sets the value for different activities? Um, how do you decide what the activities are and whether or not people follow through with them? And then are the news sources kind of balanced on both sides slash side agnostic? That is to say, if there's a news story about some bill that liberalizes uh, one issue and then on the other side, there's an opposition to that that take the opposite stance. Will your app allow activists on both sides to get those items and react accordingly? Yeah. I'm just going to repeat that back to make sure we understood great, and also for the live questions. stream. First of all, uh, who sets the value of the different activism items? Who sets what the activism items actually are? And will the news items carry both sides of the issue? Is that correct? All right. Ready to go? So, I'll, I'll answer one of the questions. Basically, as far as the value and the point system goes, we're looking at um, points, and, and we'll put this all within like when we strategize the, around the game mechanic and things like that. But basically, we'll get, dole out points for actions, but the points that require more of an engagement, like actually you know, uh, staging like a digital rights campaign or calling a chairman versus just clicking on something or you know, something that's sort of like click activism. Basically, the things that require a little bit more engagement, we'll put like a points multiplier on. So that is something that we're looking at. Getting arrested uh, gives you more points. Does getting arrested give you more points? I think that's, I think you'd become like, you get an ambassador yeah. badge for that. <laughs> um, and then uh, as far as verification goes, that is something that we're very much thinking about. Um, so we're thinking about have, setting up the partnerships and the relationships with the NGO NGOs and then having a contact there verify that somebody actually did it. And of course, that would only be if, if something was done um, in, you know, that was specific to that particular NGO as, as far as as far as like specific actions go. But to your third point, that was actually a piece of advice that we've been discussing recently. Uh, because you're right, you can't just read one article on one issue yeah. from one perspective and expect to go out and do something about it. And in terms of the way we want to incentivize more uh, a greater understanding, there are different ways to do that. Perhaps you need to read several different news items before you can even see what the actions are. Maybe you get more points if you continue to educate yourself on the issue. Um, in terms of Achieving a balance, that's you know, going to be a very subjective thing. How do we know when we've had enough of each side? But we want to encourage, yes, continual learning and understanding about the issue, not just you know, read it and go. One thing we're also looking at is um, porting it over so it can be customized and white labeled for educational institutions. So if teachers want to educate on a particular topic, like say health sciences, we can have it so it's filtered only to articles about health sciences and the actions are ported over as well. So it's something that is also sort of a, a relationship we're looking at. Uh, over here. Let me repeat that back. You're asking how to move to a digital strategy that leverages already existing information? Yes. Well, the brilliant thing about Reactor is that we're building it as a platform and that we want it to be something much like Facebook or really any social media type of thing today. We want it to be something that people can use and populate with their own issues. Um, of course, this, this requires a number of things. It requires you as a news consumer to pull in different news stories that you think are relevant. And it also means that other people interested in the issue can pull in things of their own. So it's really, a, a, we want to encourage a type of collaborative understanding here and encourage news and activism that's not, that's not just based on one person's agenda, but a number of different person's people's interests and thoughts upon the process. But we certainly want to make a React available for you and anybody else interested in doing what you described. I think there was one more. I okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget this. I just love people that do their homework. That is so beautiful. You've got it down to five minutes. <laughs> Really is good. And then I'll see if we can back the questions. Mm -hmm. yes.
Okay, let's right, see here. So here, uh, let okay. me do this. Okay, uh, the, okay, this is not a PowerPoint. Not PowerPoint. This is a LibreOffice. Let's see here. Let's see. Oh God. Yeah, right. So this may be it. Yeah, right. Give me a, just a second here to. What happened there? Okay. Right. Um, All right, this arrow here. Sure. Now. All right, get out of the way. Okay, now we're there. All right. Okay. And we go, want to go away. Go back. Okay. All right. All right, now, can you hear me from this? I don't think this works at all. Huh? All right, is this $10 bill for my aggravation? Or... Whose is this? I don't know. Let's not worry about it. Yeah, it, was, it appeared out of nowhere. Okay. Um, is there any other microphone I should hold? Let me also say this yeah. briefing will appear. Right. Use this for the streaming. So just take that. All right. And that's not going to amplify it. This, uh, this briefing will appear magically at phibetaiota.net. I can't remember whether I said it for 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. But if you read the briefing with the words in the notes format, you'll have a sense of what I was hoping to say. Um, I will be quick in about 30 minutes. My Q&A record is eight hours and one minute, but I don't think we're doing that tonight. Um, so let me say that I'm honored to be in your company. And I salute not only all of you in the room, but all of you out in the live stream, and then this will become a YouTube uh, later with thanks to the Internet Society and Reclaim and Echo for all their good work. I've been marginalized by the U.S. government, as so many of us have, um, and I regret that. But I stand before you free, uh, and I wanted to honor Leia Lynn Plante, who was a prisoner of state in, uh, on the West Coast uh, for basically being a, a vocal legal dissident. I believe in America and America the Beautiful. But I'm very, very concerned about our government and the predatory capitalist system that it's supporting. It no longer supports we, the people. And that is something that we need to do something about. And we do that by restoring public agency. Now, how do I turn this here? And then click. OK, good. So for those of you that either have something else to do or want to be able to come back to this later, I've put up a tiny URL here, OSE-2014. And that takes you right to the briefing, OSE in capital letters-2014. The first and long version of this briefing was given at Gnomedex in Seattle in 2007. And you can find that with a link at that tiny URL. The manifesto and chapters extracts are available free online. I deeply regret that I made a bargain with the devil in order to put this book into bookstores. And it is the only one of my nine books that is not free online. All my other books are free online. But I certainly would be glad if someone decided to buy those very inexpensive books at the back of the room. Uh, and I will stay to sign or, or write obscene messages in any of them. Uh, most of my stuff and the stuff of 800 other people is free online at phibetaiota.net. Now, why does open source everything matter? It matters because it's root. We are in a very complex world that is failing. And I just want to show this as a very brief overview. And you can study this later. The 1% are sucking the life out of our world. And they will keep on doing it until we get, as the earlier speaker on the internet pointed out, until we get our autonomous internet. We need an autonomous internet. We need to restore public agency to what we are about. Now, there are some positive trends. 
And I'm very happy about this. The most singular positive trend is that the Department of Homeland Security and Halliburton have figured out that there aren't enough guns, there aren't enough railway cars with shackles, there aren't enough SWAT teams to keep us all down. We have vastly more power than we really understand and are utilizing. And I will tell you, one of the YouTubes uh, of me briefing Occupy on electoral reform went sort of viral after it hit the front page of Reddit. If Occupy had listened in 2011, today we would have electoral reform. I had to run for president to find out that we have eight accredited parties in the United States. And we have a two-party tyranny that is not only blocking access for everybody else, it's borrowing $1 trillion a year in our name in order to keep up this loot fest that they have going. Now this is a very simplified version of revolution. And this is all by way of framing why open source everything matters. Most critical is the fact that our leaders are betraying the public trust every single day. And I had to read a book called Deer Hunting with Jesus to understand that it's not just Washington. It's every small town across the United States of America. It's the Rotary Club, it's the Elks, it's everybody in the planning council of every small local government that cuts deals with corporations and gives them tax breaks and pollution exemptions and that basically guts the educational fund of the local community which is generally based on real estate taxes. We have got to put a people's microscope on all of these. Now it is not my intent that you study this next slide here and now. I did a graduate thesis on predicting revolution and this slide is easily found online. You can explode this slide. In red are all of the preconditions of revolution that exist in the United States today. At the highest level of thinking, what this boils down to is a loss of government legitimacy and the fact that the public no longer believes anything the U.S. government says. The unemployment rate today is not 7%. It is closer to 23%. Check out uh, shadowstats.com, a marvelous source of credible, truthful information. At the end of the day, open source is about open mind, transparency, truth, and trust. I love CEO Bob Seeler, New York-based Saatchi and Saatchi. He likes to say, until you get the truth on the table, no matter how ugly it is, you cannot deal with it. We have a government that is not just in denial, it is pathologically against our public interests in every possible sense of the word, across every possible mission area. Now what is to be done? These are four very quick slides before my master slide. I have a sense of timing, so I don't like interruptions on indigenous natives, but I will tell you that indigenous natives are core. The book 1491 tells us just how wise our indigenous forebearers were. They would sit down in a council of everybody and they would not leave until everybody agreed. This is how you get to a sustainable decision. They would put all of the facts on the table. They would take the long view, seventh generation thinking. How will this affect the seventh generation? This is not something we do today. I also show here the eight tribes of information, academic, civil society, commerce, government, law enforcement, media, military, and non-governmental nonprofit. The US government is the least informed of all of these tribes. And until we learn how to do hybrid governance, and bring to the table everything that all eight tribes know, and make decisions based on ethical, evidence-based decision support, we will continue to be, as Lawrence of Arabia so famously called the Arabs, a little people, a greedy people, a stupid people.
We don't have a smart nation today, and it's our fault because we are putting up with a stupid government that is out of control. Now, in relation to the objectives of this conference, this is my most important slide. It's a slide I developed over 10 years ago. And the key point here is that open source software, which most people know, or open data, which people are talking about, are completely ineffective in isolation. There is an open source ecology. And you must integrate all of the opens all of the time. You have to have open cloud, open data, open hardware, open government, open software, open spectrum, open standards. These all have to come together. Because in isolation, for example, open data is code for give me all your data, but you still have to buy my proprietary software. You have to have all of the opens all of the time. I believe the cyber commons is the foundation for humanity's future. And it cannot be enclosed or corrupted, or we are lost. Now, back in the day when I had money, I channeled my surplus funds into creating the Earth Intelligence Network. It's an accredited, but now unfunded, 501c3. I led 23 others in creating this model. And one of the things we realized, and particularly this is pointed out in C.K. Prahalad's book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, capitalism today, corrupt as it is, is focused on the one billion rich who have an annual aggregate tr income of $1 trillion a year. The five trillion poor have an annual aggregate income of $4 trillion a year. But instead of buying a sub-zero refrigerator for $2,000, they are buying a ceramic jar with an air gap inside of another ceramic jar that costs $2, and when buried in the ground, keeps milk fr uh, meat fresh for five days. We have to redirect out, and oh, by the way, the New York Times declined an op-ed on this. Um, now, Medard Gabel, co-creator with Buckminster Fuller of the Analog World Game, is a member of our team. And he created, he's the architect of a global game. A digital global game would represent the true cost of all products. Most people have no idea how much water, child labor, tax avoidance, and other crimes are in any given product, service, or behavior. We can move markets overnight. And one of the points that I try to make to my internet colleagues who focus on the internet, and by the way, I'm glad I sat through the whole program because I learned a lot of stuff that I did not know. And I was enormously impressed by Hunter's brief on dark fiber. He's trying to avoid a fight, but I think a fight is inevitable. Um, I was a ghostwriter for the Commandant of the Marine Corps once, and writing testimony forms, speaking to Congress about why the Marine Corps was the only service that had both communications and intelligence under the same general, I coined the phrase, communications without intelligence is noise. Intelligence without communications is irrelevant. The problem that I have with the internet world is they're forgetting about content. The reason we're so screwed up in computers is because back in the 1980s, nobody talked to a librarian. And so we ended up with electronic wastebaskets. We ended up with electronic systems that still today do not make sense. I'm a member with Larry Page at the Silicon Valley Hackers Conference. And I keep saying, when are you going to start making sense? Google today is not about making sense. Google today is about fencing cyberspace. It's about enclosing the commons. It's about charging you for digitizing dead authors' works on whom copyright has expired. Google was thrown out of Boston because the librarians were outraged that Google was trying to claim the right to copyright everything they digitized. Now, I will say that I think Google Earth is very cool. I would like to see it become open source. Keyhole markup language is really utterly fantastic, but right now it only applies to geospatial information. I want to see uh, keyhole markup language migrate so that we can have a sparse matrix in which all information is available for any given point on the Earth, and you can also follow the provenance of a product 
from the grapes to the, to the grape crushing, to the bottle, to all of the toxins that come along with that. And eventually the day is going to come when you can look at a handheld, scan a barcode, and it is going to show you a red, yellow, or green circle that essentially says, buy this, it's green and sustainable, or screw this product, you don't want to touch it, or yellow, here's another product you might wish to consider. On that day, content within the internet will move markets. Now, I realize I'm talking to a lot of people that are smarter than I am in the cyber arena. I'm more like a pissed off end user. Um, I was on the artificial intelligence staff of the Central Intelligence Agency in the Office of Information Technology. I did one of the only functional requirements surveys they've ever done. Generally, the IT world in the US government just throws money to contractor. The contractor writes the statement of work, and the government buys whatever shit they can't sell to anybody else. Uh, this is really scary stuff. Do not underestimate the ignorance of US government contracting officers and contracting officer technical representatives, of whom I was one. The approach to cyberspace today among institutions is institutionalized idiocy. This is the red part here. Now, I recommend to everyone the work of Robert Garig. And if you go to phibetaiota.net, you can look him up. He and I together put together this green alternative approach to cybersecurity. And Robert, who unfortunately died uh, at about the age of 50, I miss him very much, understood that security is not about control. Security is about trust. And someone got a Nobel Prize for demonstrating that trust lowers the cost of doing business. What we have today is a world in which trust has been killed. Now, I want to put you on as I draw to my close to the ideas of others. These are two of the most important books that I have read recently, Governing the Commons. She received a Nobel Prize. This is about hybrid governance that is based on shared information and ethical evidence-based decision support. Today in Washington, as most of you know, decisions are made on the basis of who pays to be heard. They are not made on the basis of sound facts and good judgment. And we allow that to happen. When Newt Gingrich destroyed Speaker Wright, a story told in The Power and the Ambition, Congress abdicated its Article I responsibility for checks and balances. Congressmen became foot soldiers for their parties. And they no longer represent their constituents. In fact, they no longer understand the issues. They're simply told how to vote. And their staff isn't worth much either. So we have some issues to deal with. Now, all of these links here that I'm showing. Ah, good, thank you. All of these links that I'm showing, I ended up by accident being the number one Amazon reviewer for nonfiction. And I discovered in about 2005, when I finally had a chance to have a townhouse for my library, um, that was before I lost everything, uh, that I read in 98 categories. And you can find all of that at Phi Beta Iota under the page for books. But here are some lists of reviews. 10 high-level threats, core policies, books on true cost economics, uh, books on all the opens, and then positive and negative book reviews, and then, of course, 9-11, which if we have a Q&A, I will be glad to talk about. I really respect the thoughts of others. And when I stand before you today with my own commentary, it is standing on the shoulders of thousands of other people whose works I have read. Amazon may have some issues, but I think Amazon could be the hub of the world brain one day. The top authors, the top reviewers, the top readers, based on geospatial locality. And so I encourage everyone to take advantage of what Amazon offers in the way of reviews uh, of books. Now, this is the result. And I don't know why this is screwing up my slides. Um, but this is the result of 25 years worth of thinking. And I'll let you study it later. Essentially, we have to integrate education, intelligence, and research. You can't have smart spies in a dumb nation. 
you can't have a smart nation with dumb spies. And right now we have a dumb nation in every possible sense of the word. We here are the survivors. And governance must be hybrid in nature. The U.S. government is sadly ignorant about everything. And part of the problem is it doesn't care. Paul Pilar has written a book about how intelligence doesn't matter in Washington because decisions are not based on intelligence, never mind the fact that intelligence doesn't actually know anything useful. General Tony Zinni is on record as saying that when he was commander of the Central Command, he got, at best, 4% of what he needed to know from our $80 billion a year secret sources and methods community. And one of the dirty little secrets of NSA, apart from the ch fact that the Chinese have been writing the electrical wires in for the last 10 years, is that they process less than 1% of what they collect. Don't worry about mass surveillance. Mass surveillance is really just code for spending a shitload of money without accountability. That's what NSA does. And I credit William Binney with this. NSA moves money so that Congress can get its 5% kickback. That's what this is all really about. It's not really about mass surveillance. Now, this is what I would like to build. I'm glad to be here in the New York School. Nothing would please me more than to have some, some serious people in New York City take an interest in turning New York into the home of the World Brain Institute with a global serious game, a center for public intelligence. There is plenty of money out there. We have multi-billionaires throwing $500 million chunks at getting better forms of soy because they've decided to improve their diet. What we can't find is multi-billionaires interested in creating a smart nation. And I don't know how to do that. I am a complete failure at business and fundraising. And so I give you these ideas of mine, hopeful that you might be able to take them and show them to somebody. Because eventually, the world brain will be a self-sustaining enterprise that makes money. I've said for 20 years, information costs money, intelligence makes money. I would be willing to pay 1% of every transaction if I could turn to my handheld device and receive decision support in relation to that transaction. Now, a few of us have fought for 25 years. I'm 61 today. I started this fight in 1988 when I created the Marine Corps Intelligence Command, and I had top secret everything, and I had one little PC in the corner going to the internet. And back in 1988, the internet was called the source, okay, kind of the early version. Uh, my analyst started standing in line for the internet, and I said, what are you doing? I just spent $20 million so you could have the best of everything, including access to all the secrets. And there's nothing in the secret databases about Haiti or Burundi or Somalia or any of the other practical things we need to know on a day-to-day -day basis. The reality is the secret world doesn't focus on everything. I wrote an article for Counterpunch called Intelligence for the President and Everybody Else. The secret world is long overdue for being put out of business. We need to create a public intelligence agency. And I have actually gotten OMB to agree twice to an open source agency that would not only nurture open source intelligence, but all of the opens. In fact, all Hunter needs is $100 million to create his, his public dark fiber around the country. $100 million is chump change in Washington. But you have to find a coalition willing to support it. Now, I have posted my correspondence to the Vice President, uh, which I don't believe reached the Vice President, although I have a certified mail rece receipt. I'm quite sure that his intelligence community minder intercepted that correspondence and destroyed it. Uh, however, I have made it public. And I hope that one day the Vice President will hear from one of his constituents and learn that his mail is being controlled. We are not the only people who are being screwed over. Congress and the White House are being surveilled and screwed over. 
and they haven't completely figured that out yet. So there is an opportunity to create a smart nation. Now this is my last slide. I happen to be a fan of the United Nations despite its horrific problems. Basically the United Nations consists of one-third uh, nepotism, one-third spies, and one-third really good people carrying the burden for everybody else. Uh, one of whom is in the audience, maybe. Um, I actually worked for the UN. And if there's one place that's more corrupt than the US government, it's the UN. Uh, but they have enormous potential. I believe that the United Nations is a place where, and New York City, is a place where we can create an autonomous internet, a mindset and a culture of open source everything, and we can take liberation technology to the nth degree. And what that means is free energy. Free energy has been around for quite a while. And if you go to Phi Beta Iota, I commend to you Sepp Hasselberger, without an E, H-A-S-S-L and then Berger. Sepp Hasselberger is a curator for alternative energies. We have many such minds all over the world. So let me stop there. Um, I regret that I could not bring copies of my Open Source Everything Manifesto, but if you look up Open Source Everything Manifesto, you'll find as much as you can find free online. Uh, and the book is on sale at Amazon. I, I, again, I regret uh, doing that. But I, what I think I will do is I'm going to send David a watermarked electronic copy of the book. And so if anyone wants an electronic copy of the book with my apologies for the watermark, send David an email. And uh, president. president at ISOC, I ISOC dash. dash ny.org. You should be able to find that. All right, let me stop there. I am very grateful for the invitation, and I'm now going to turn it over to the organizers who will, who will organize our remaining minutes together. Well, we're open for questions first, so, uh, so let's just open this up for Q&A first. All right, Q&A. Whoever shouted Q&A gets the first question. Okay, yeah, today is the uh, opening of the 9-11 Museum. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh. I, I just, you know, get, I, if there's something liberating that, that can be said, I mean, especially when uh, a lot of times I, I, I believe in words you can't handle the truth. All right, well, <laughs> you can handle the truth. Uh, if you go to Phi Beta Iota, or if you actually just look up 9-11 Convergence, you will find the best information I've been able to put together on 9-11, including stuff from Richard Gage and others. We were warned by 13 countries in advance of 9-11. Three months prior to 9-11, Dick Cheney ordered a national counterterrorism exercise for the entire nation for the day. The FEMA Emergency Center was set up on the piers of New York the night before 9-11. The dogs were removed from the buildings two weeks prior to 9-11 and not returned. Larry Silverstein, with the collaboration of the, intelligence, of the uh, insurance companies, executed a $7 billion insurance scam. Okay? The three WTC buildings were brought down by controlled demolitions. The Pentagon was hit by a missile, which allegedly wiped out the computers that held all the data on the missing 2.3 trillion, which Rumsfeld was being grilled about the day before by Cynthia McKinney. So on 9-11, what I will tell you is I cannot convict, nor do I wish to. I'm a truth and reconciliation guy. I am not about vindictive justice. I'm about get the truth on the table and let's move on. All right, but on 9-11, I can tell you with absolute certainty and with a salute toward Rupert, who, who suicided himself, uh, perhaps to give his family the life insurance before his term ran out, um, there is ample evidence to indict Rudy Giuliani, Larry Silverstein, and Dick Cheney. And the 9-11 investigation was a goddamn sham. It was a cover-up. It was as worthless as the Warren Commission. Um, so that's it on 9-11. Well, okay, so, so you, we have this presented narrative, and then we have people who have chosen to lift up the curtain. What, what can you say in the, in the meta picture of 
well, what are the implications of that? What are the ramifications? Of that? And rather than just getting upset, what can we do about it? Well, so let me give you this. Counter narrative and counter phrase. Let me throw in Sandy Hook and the Boston bombing and go back to JFK and Martin Luther King. The JFK assassination has now unraveled completely. We now know that Lyndon Baines Johnson was central to this, that he met with um, Edgar Hoover and a bunch of Texas uh, oil people and New York money people and the Cuban mafia based in New Orleans and essentially, and the Israelis, the Mossad. Reuben was in Dallas. George Bush was in Dallas on the day of the assassination. This is now clearly known. And I would love to see the day when George Bush Sr. is faced with truth and reconciliation, and Reuben as well, uh, if he hasn't died already. I forget which one of those guys died. Kennedy was about, Kennedy basically picked a fight with everybody, including Israel on nuclear materials that CIA was smuggling out through Mexico. Uh, he was uh, going up against the New York banks. He was going up against the mafia. He and Khrushchev were actually having discussions about completely reducing the nuclear um, stockpile. And they were both commiserating with one another because their biggest enemy was their own generals. All right? Martin Luther King was killed by an army sniper on detail to the FBI. This is a book told, in a, this is a story told in a book called Act of State. And the King family won this confession from the US government in a federal court about 10 years ago. All right, now what is happening here is it's all starting to unravel. Sandy Hook was an unoccupied school. This was a DHS exercise. The key actor, the so-called father, has been discovered and outed, including his sideburns still showing from the tan lines from when he shaved to, to dress up for the part. Uh, Boston bombings. The priests and rabbis that rushed to comfort comfort the victims were held back. They weren't allowed to get near anybody. Why? Because these were all actors. The amputee that was the star of the show was on hire from a company that specializes in providing amputees with blood makeup for military exercises. Now let me throw in pedophilia, which is huge in New York, and it's huge in Boston and it's huge in Washington, D.C. And some of you may have heard about the Franklin scandal in, in Kansas City. I personally think that pedophilia is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. The U.S. public is in massive denial on just how corrupt its elite are. And pedophilia is considered an elite privilege. So all of this stuff, in my view, is bubbling up and starting to come together. And I don't know when it will break. But there will come a day when the public wakes up and says, oh my God, and I don't know what will happen. I hope it will be nonviolent. Um, I personally believe that we can and should achieve a nonviolent revolution. I personally believe that we should be extraordinarily tolerant and that we should deeply, deeply grasp the principles of truth and reconciliation. Although Nelson Mandela sold out, uh, the gold mines and a few other things. I love the man. He set an example. So in my view, we're within five years of a wake up public moment. And I hope I live to see it. Shall we stop there and get questions from others? Or yeah. what do you want to do? Sure, let's see uh, more questions. Or I can just stop. Yeah. Yes, no, sir. Yes. First, the gentleman in the, in the black shirt, and then in front of you. No, I do not know about the Main Corps program. Okay. Uh, so, so let's skip to another question. Okay. Have you found a look you know about the trivia method of learning from like Tragedy and Hope Communications website? I, I no, but you yeah, I'm John fascinated. Taylor the trivia method of learning sparks. Uh, I just did a letter to the CEO of Pearson Education. Turns out Pearson Education is not just an SAT testing company, it now tutors people. And the same people that score the test tutor the people. And they have a global network of people. They're like a CIA for normal people in a possible sense. 
And what the 24 people, I was number 24, what the 24 people who created Earth Intelligence Network came to the conclusion back when I had money and I could fund all this, was that the five billion poor, the brains of the five billion poor are the one unlimited resource we have on this planet. And oh, by the way, a brain is a million times more energy efficient than any computer existing or likely to exist in the, in the next 20 years. Singularity is crap, as far as I'm concerned. And this new artificial intelligence thing is crap, okay? Um, the five billion rich, I mean, the five billion poor do not have 18 years to sit in a classroom and learn how to be good prisoners. So what we have to do is offer them a chance to learn from their cell phones one cell call at a time. And so the concept that I have is that on a daily basis, you'll get a fun prompt that will give you elementary education. You will have call centers and diasporas, such as Crisis Mappers uses, to translate Haitian Creole into English and then post it on a map. So you will be able to call a center of the diaspora and get any question answered free, okay? And then at the same time, and this is where Pearson is moving in useful new directions, it turns out education isn't that useful for a lot of people. Skills are. We call that training. So I see video training coming to the point where you can dial in and say, I have a broken Romanian engine, and this part has broken. How do I fix it? And you pull up a five-minute video on your cell phone that tells you how to remove the part and how to put up an internet appeal for a spare part such that, for example, a Romanian engineer, because in Africa there are a lot of 1950s Romanian engines, a Romanian engineer will say, well, we no longer make this part, but I have a lathe. I will make this part. And then a German comes in and says, I will pay to FedEx this part to the nearest capital city. And an NGO person comes in and says, I will deliver this part and post a photo of mission accomplished. Okay, so for me, when you ask a question about trivial learning, what you're really talking about is education one fact at a time, one answer at a time. That's the direction we have to go in. Ma uh, massive online open courses don't work. They have a 4% graduation rate, okay? They're largely a waste of time. Uh, and they're basically Rushkoff, Russell Acoff, Russell Acoff would tell you Massive online courses are an example of doing the wrong thing righter, okay? Doing the right thing is what Earth Intelligence Network designed and what your question implies. David, I'm at your service or I can stop. Uh, Ted? Uh, hang on, you had your chance. Gender? We have 10 more minutes. We need a question from a lady? Do we have a lady? With a question? Come on, I'm begging you. <laughs> I will ask you yes. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna come by. As, as you stated that we are talking about education and how do we educate the poor and the powerless in developing countries. So what I'm hearing you say that really we need to look at new technology in order to look at skill-based education is the driving force for the future. Is that where we need to go yeah, instead of looking Everything converges. At everything converges. For instance, I like Google's gray box phone, mm -hmm. but I'm also a huge fan of OpenBTS. OpenBTS stands for Open Base Transceiver Station, which stands for free cell phones. I believe that we should give every person on the planet a free cell phone for life. Mm -hmm. Now, I think NSA will pay for that because it means that we have their phone number. Okay? So there's always a trade-off. Okay? But the bottom line here is that if you give every person a free cell phone for life, you then monetize their questions or their warnings. One of the issues we have in India and other places is dead birds. So what happens if every person who sees a dead bird takes a picture and sends it in with a geospatial location and a time and date stamp? You have got warning of a disease that money cannot buy, all right? So essentially, you're harnessing the distributed intelligence of the whole Earth, all right? So what I would say to you is, on the one hand, we've got technology becoming affordable. On the other hand, we have a new economic perspective. It's like Gillette, sell the shave, not the razor. Mm -hmm. Give them the razor, okay? And don't charge them for the answers. Charge someone else for the questions, 
okay? And then finally, have a completely shifted mindset about what does it mean to be educated. I, I have very low emotional IQ, okay? One of my colonels once said, I have the ability to piss off an inanimate object in the next room, okay? And it's a gift. It really is. Uh, and so I apologize for that. But the reality is what they need to learn is they don't need to learn algebra. They need to learn how to get the price of oranges in the next town. They need to learn how to do drip agriculture. They need to learn that five cents spent on chlorine in the water of their children stops diarrhea. Okay? So I'm very, I have goosebumps, okay? I'm very excited. I think the convergence of technology and new thinking and need and a realization that the heart, I, I lectured Brent Scowcroft, and if you look up uh, Steel Scowcroft on YouTube, you'll get right to my three minute lecture. Nothing the United States of America does in the next 25 years matters unless we get our act together and we create an analytic model, a holistic analytic model with true cost economics, and we figure out how to educate and inform and embrace and nurture the five billion poor, mm -hmm. because Brazil, and China, yeah. and India, and Indonesia, and Iran, and Russia, and Venezuela, and wild cards like Malaysia, and Turkey, and Nigeria. They are the future. Mm -hmm. Lee Kuan Yew, Minister Mentor Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore got it right. Mm -hmm. Demography, not democracy, is the future. Mm -hmm. All right, and if we want to see a good future, then we have to see what's going on in Indonesia which has done a very fine job of maintaining a secular government with respect for the Islamic traditions, all right? Um, so skills and parts related and location related, I mean, there's all of this stuff converging. The problem is that the government, the banks, and the corporations are fighting to the bitter end. They absolutely do not want to change. And I have another 20 years left in me. If I had to do it over again, I think I would start in Maine or New Hampshire. And I would basically work my way out, and I would try and take every village off the grid, and then I would start putting legislators in who would nullify every federal regulation. For example, meatpacking regulations are designed to put the small town butcher out of business. Uh, mega agriculture, mega energy, mega health, all of this, 50% inefficiency, 5% pork to the congressman, 5% uh, payoff to every congressman. All of this is bad for us. So at, as I draw to my final 20 years, I've come to believe that bottom-up resilience is the only way to go, uh, that we need to focus on the intersection of free energy, which allows for water distillation mm -hmm. and cleaning. I actually did a project for Somalia where I was able, in theory, to resettle one million Somalis on a deserted part of the Somali coast and I was able to give them free water, free, well, free energy, free water, free telecommunications, and a startup hydroponics and, and, uh, and goat tending industry for $500 per person. $500 million, okay, to resettle 1 million Somalis and give them a full-up village with the basic, and all of you have heard of the open source ecology, the global village construction set. Mm -hmm. Uh, where they solve the two biggest problems you have in any population, which is creating free houses using dirt and water, mm -hmm. and they have rain harvesting and water desalination, plus every house has a compost toilet so that you don't need central sewage and you don't need central water. All right, that's a very long answer, I apologize, but I'm very excited by the future. But I'm oh. glad, uh, thank you for sharing with me. Do you see coming out with a best practice based on the model that you're speaking of? Um, Will that be the way to go? I think other smarter people are going to do good things that will very rapidly catch fire. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the issues I have with the United States is everyone's hung up on creating smart apps for smartphones owned by smart rich people. Uh, I would really focus on simpler apps for simpler phones for simpler people uh, because my focus is the five billion poor, not the one billion rich. Um, and um, I have a wife and three kids, so I can't just pick up and move to India. Um, but I believe that others will. Uh, and I also believe that the future is found in the pedagogy of freedom, uh, the idea of participatory budgeting, 
uh, the refusal of people to accept corruption on the part of their local government. Um, I'm sorry that's a long-winded answer, but uh, it's a good time to be alive. All right, I think, y yes, sir. database of, as of 2008, 8 million Americans that will be interrogated or detained. Is my name on it? 8 million dissidents. 8 million dissidents. Is my name on it? It probably is. You're a dissident, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm a loyal, constructive critic. Uh, you know, um, you know I, I got to tell you, I used to, I opened the Hackers Conference in 1994, Hackers on Planet Earth. And I used to say that given a choice between incompetence and conspiracy, always go with incompetence, okay? Now, these days I distinguish between good people trapped in a bad system. 90% of the U.S. government is good people trapped in a bad system living from paycheck to paycheck, okay? Now, at the very top, you have politicals who respond to money, and you have political appointees who respond to money, and you have flag officers and senior executive officers who respond to money. And we don't have a counterintelligence system in the United States. I will tell you right now, the FBI is about cosmetics. It's about chasing little people. It's not about actually putting ideological, religious, and financial traitors in jail. Okay, they're more of a protective service. For example, taking the pedophilia axis between Boston, New York, and Washington, you never see the FBI touch that. Now, part of that is because there's a deep state within the U.S. government. These are people who self-select and recruit and promote from within. And essentially, when John Deutsch, the director of the CIA, went to Los Angeles and said, I knew nothing about the crack cocaine explosion and the import of, of cocaine from Nicaragua and Ricky Ross doing great things, $2 million a day, Deutsch was telling the truth, okay? CIA has elements within CIA that get military call signs for contractor planes that fly into El Toro Air Base and unload cocaine, and they're basically given a free pass. And this is part of national security, off-budget funding, and, and, and so forth, all right? So the institutions themselves are actually trying to do the best they can, but they are penetrated. They, they have limpet fish within them that can take the institutions and make them do evil things. Um, let me stop there. Yes, sir. What do you think about uh, Lawrence Lessig's uh, Mayday pack and getting money out of the Well, Lawrence and I have talked about this. And I've told Lawrence that getting money out of, uh, uh, the question was, what do I think about Lawrence Lessig's idea about getting money out of politics, all right? It doesn't matter. <laughs> As long as you have a two-party tyranny that can block everybody else from getting on the ballot and can make most people's votes not count, it doesn't matter, all right? Money is a tiny, tiny part of the corruption that infects our electoral system. I actually ran for president because I was unemployed, and it was fun to see how much money I could raise in six weeks, because I wanted to put all the good ideas in one place, bigbatusa.org and because I wanted to be able to write a letter to all the other small party candidates and see if I could get them to come together around the one thing we can all agree on, which is electoral reform. I wanted to have an electoral reform summit. I wanted to have Occupy, Occupy the home offices of all senators and congressmen and force them to understand that if they did not pass electoral reform, which means essentially all parties and all independents on every ballot for federal office, then we would run them out of town on, on, uh, on a rail. And I couldn't get that to happen. Electoral reform is actually 11 different points. If you look up the Electoral Reform Act on the internet, one of the things I found when I did the, the uh, intervention with Occupy, it's a six minute tape. If you look up Steel Electoral Reform Occupy YouTube, or you'll get right to it is that when I did that, people came out of the woodwork. And inside of a week, I had crowdsourced an Electoral Reform Act. Because everybody that mattered, that really cared passionately about electoral reform, jumped out of the woodwork and said, oh, wait a minute, but you forgot this, and you forgot this, and you forgot this, OK? There are 11 things that need to be in an Electoral Reform Act. Money is one of them. So I love Lawrence Lessig. I think he's great. but. He's focusing on a tiny part of the problem. And this is, what, this is why holistic thinking matters. 
okay? Essentially, with holistic thinking, you have to attack all of the, all of the cancers at the same time. You can't just attack one, otherwise it's like whack-a-mole, okay? Does that answer your question? All right, I think what, one more question and we stop? All right, let's stop there. It's nine o'clock, they're throwing us out of the building. Um, and I thank you, and um, I'm just really glad to be here, and I'll tell you, I feel positive about New York City. I feel positive about everybody in this room. I feel positive about everybody on live stream. And by God, if there's one book you want to read or if there's one book review you want to read, read my review of a book called, and let me end on this note, it's called The Average American, okay? This journalist went out and spent two years looking for the average American. He finally found this guy, 18 month mark. He decided if he doesn't write me or email me or nag me, then he's the average American. And the guy didn't, so he went back at the two year mark and he said to this guy, he said, you're the average American. And the guy said, wow, what an honor. Exactly. Thank you.